This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Sure. All right. Seeing the presence of a quorum, I'll call to order this meeting of the Pelham School Committee, and we'll start with uh, roll call attendance. Um, Ms. Barlow. Brenda, aye. Um, Ms. Kenny? Kenny present. Mr. Menino? Menino present. And Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. And Hall present. Back to you, Chair McDonald. Um, and seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order the meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 6.32 p.m. Um, I will take a roll call for comments. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer present. And McDonald present. And now seeing a presence of the quorum of the Region School Committee, I'm calling to order that meeting also at 632, according to my clock. Um, so uh, please stay present when I call your name. Um, Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. Mr. Menino? Menino present. Ms. Seeger? Seeger present. Ms. Spitzer? Spencer present. Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. McDonald present. And Mr. Sullivan? Don't think he's here yet. Okay. So we are now um, to order. Um, our first order of business is to approve minutes for a meeting that didn't happen. Um, so <laughs> So, uh, with the uh, committee's permission, we'll move on to the next um, order and um, welcome Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, can you hear us? Yep, sure. Great. Um, so, moving on to our next order of business, we have public comment. Um, and because we uh, had to cancel our or postpone our meeting from Tuesday, August 4th, Tonight we have the public comment that had been originally submitted for that meeting, as well as a few other items that were submitted for tonight's meeting. Um, so I will start with the um, voice messages. Hi, my name is Dejanera Gerdo. I live in the town of Amherst. And I would like to have Sia to discuss a vote and a vote of starting all remote classes. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Maria Aquino and my, I live at Cali, Massachusetts. I would like to ask the school committee um, to vote for uh, remote learning, to start the remote learning uh, for all the safety of the students. Please start the year as a remote learning. We need the student to be safe. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Um, I have two voice messages from the same person and the same phone number, so I'm playing the one that was received most recently. Um, they were received within six minutes of each other. My name is Liz. I live in Holyoke, but I work um, for the Amherst Regional Schools. I work in a specialized special education program, and I am calling to encourage you to support a full remote return back to school in the fall for the safety of our students as well as our staff. Um, I would also encourage you to think about how you are meeting today virtually for the safety of yourselves as well as your family. I hope that we would use those same, same standards when it comes to our students' health and the staff's health. 
Uh, I'd also like to look at the phase one population that is returning back to school. First, it is our most marginalized group of students. I would hope that we don't put their lives in jeopardy just to be returning back to school. I think people need to support those students the most and keep their lives as well as the other lives of the students at a very, very high standard. Thank you. My name is Lilian Araya. I am a paraeducator in Fort River School in Amherst. And I want to say that I am considered to go to start the year as remote learning for the sake of our students and also for the sake of us as a staff. Thank you. And now I'll share the written comments. And just as a reminder, this um, document, this full document um, is or will be posted on um, on the website. Are you seeing the document? Does it say? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, the comments that were received for Tuesday were posted on Tuesday um, or Wednesday morning. So those those are available. Um, the new comments will be posted and the, this entire document will be posted as soon as possible. I will um, add this next comment was received, um, was forwarded to me um, in Spanish because I don't read Spanish. I translated it, my, I just used uh, the Google Translate in my email. So I'm sharing that, that document for others who may not, um, may not also uh, read Spanish, but I'm showing both.
the um, the rest of these comments were comments that were submitted earlier, and I've noted which when they were submitted, but they had gone to been filtered into my spam folder. Um, so I have confirmed with each one of these individuals that they would like their their comments shown um, this week.
Um, I'm noting this, this comment was played as voice message at our meeting on July 21st, um, so I'm not going to scroll slowly through it. Um, this text, like I said, is included in the document that will be posted on the website. Um, and the same goes for this one, which was also submitted and played by voice message. So this is the text of it, um, which is available online. And that is everything. So um, just for, for folks who did not watch um, our meeting a week ago when I discovered that I had all of these uh, emails, uh, the public comment emails that got filtered into spam, I just want to say publicly that I've created a filter in my, in, in my ARPS email um, that any email that comes in with the subject line public comment um, is never sent to spam and gets flagged as public comment so that I will see those. So um, as just as a reminder, um, if you do want to submit public comment for any of our meetings, please do so by sending email with that subject line public comment so that it does get flagged and does not get filtered into spam. Um, or um, our uh, voice line is always open as well and you may record a voice message at any time uh, up to 3 p.m. on the day of our meetings. And with that, I will um, turn it over to Dr. Morris for our uh, superintendent's update. Thank you. Um, so um, I received a number of questions from committee members, individual committee members about uh, distance learning or virtual education, which is a term I'd like to start using for it. Uh, and part of that's because in any of the phasing models that were presented, the majority a significant majority of students would start the year in that model. So I, I was going to do slides, and then I think you're pretty slick of, sick of slides and things that I've written, so I'm just going to go oral on that. Um, and um, as most of you know, this is the third meeting of the night for me, so uh, I, think, I think we're good on slides. Um, the first thing that I want to share is that um, there's been a actually international issue with getting enough, securing enough Chromebooks. There was a supplier um, in a specific country that was found to be um, employing child labor. So a bunch of Chromebooks that were sent to um, this country have now been taken back because um, they're legal under international law. I want to publicly thank Jerry Champagne, who has been amazing at finding other vendors and other retailers. Um, this is affecting many schools across the country, as well as in Massachusetts. Desi set up a model where we could buy Chromebooks through them um, that would come in late September. Jerry got uh, found uh, Chromebooks from um, that come from a different country, so they don't have there's there's no supplier issues that way that will be here in early September. So um, you know between the iPads that we're purchasing for kindergarten students and Chromebooks that Jerry was able to uh, find a supplier for, I think we'll be in good shape. But you may all hear that um, that there is a Chromebook shortage um, and that is a true thing. And um, just really appreciate staff. Uh, working um, all sorts of hours to try to make that happen. So we'll keep our fingers crossed, but it's a major retailer we're able to find them and the estimated uh, time of arrival is early September. When we get a little bit later to calendar, you'll see that that'll be, um, assuming it's on time, well in time for when the school year would start, uh, given the change in the calendar uh, at the state level. So then talking a little bit more about virtual education planning. Um, so uh, I don't want to rehash. We, we, we had a meeting where we spent a lot of time about um, surveying from the spring and um, what went well and some concerns. So a summary from the spring was that uh, families and actually staff, most of these were aligned between family, staff, and students, felt like there was not enough direct instruction. So last year, the guidance from DESE was much more a resource model, particularly at the K-8 level. Um, and so that was a major concern. Uh, there's a lot of concerns about relationship building and how to maintain relationships, particularly as we enter a new school year, starting new relationships online. Uh, there was concerns about consistency and alignment that actually played out, I think, in some of the public comments. I saw that as well. Uh, concerns about not enough synchronous calls that, um, that that families were getting and also that there wasn't a set schedule uh, when it was predictable and reliable when things would happen. Uh, there was also a concern about large groups, uh, like full classes, particularly at the elementary level just being insufficient to engage in dialogue and learning, that if you have 21 students on a call, much like we have a lot of people on this call, it ends up being what we're doing, which is one person talking. I will say that we experienced that in my administrative team as well. 
uh, at an administrative team meeting with seven people on it today, and the level of dialogue was wildly different than even if there was 14 people. Um, it happened to just be elementary principals and a couple others. And so uh, I don't think that's a kid thing. I think that's an everyone thing in terms of having meetings online. Um, so, you know, th there was a lot of concern and a lot of dissatisfaction with how the spring went. I, I, like I said then, I want to say that this was emergency distance learning. It wasn't virtual education. And we want to make sure that for all students who at any point in next year that we're providing a, a much different level of service. Uh, we had a group, staff groups work last spring. They came up with guiding principles for distance learning uh, in the fall. They think they're really strong and they're the foundation for our planning. Additionally, the last week or the week before, I forget, Desi came out with uh, guidance on the distance learning um, or virtual education. Uh, a couple of the changes is that direct instruction is the model. It's not resource delivery. So at the elementary level, you may remember distance learning plans, which were uh, a list of things that um, student families could do. That is not what um, the expectations are for next year. Uh, there's an expectation for regular, regular synchronous calls, for a structured daily schedule, for accountability on all ends, for attendance and work completed and grading. Uh, there's also the expectation that full curriculum standards are being taught. Last spring, the expectation was roughly half, half of the day of work, and uh, that is, is, is significantly different. So the expectations are much more robust. Um, we did get information from the commissioner that he plans to, the, the, the board likely will uh, push DESE to audit any district that's in a distance learning model to ensure that it's um, going, is working effectively next year. Um, and that's okay, because we're all new at this and we're getting better at it, and, and I'll get into how we would train folks in a bit. And so, uh, you know, one thing we did is we, we've created and posted teacher leader positions for this that would do some work in August, but have a, a partial release to their schedule in the fall. Uh, at the elementary and at the secondary level. Also, if you look at, for instance, the high school assistant principal position, try to imagine how um, we can have someone, it's an interim position, uh, take on some, some leadership uh, and support, you know, Mr. Sadiq and Dr. Gramacki on that. And, and we're building our internal capacity all the time. So we planned for professional development before the school year. Again, I'm getting the cart in front of the horse a bit, but there are 10 days now for professional development that there weren't uh, based on a, an agreement um, that Desi has shared. And so uh, we're, we're, we're looking to find um, someone who can help us with that, with a really deep embedded, uh, not rushed um, perspective on pedagogy. There's technical pieces we'll have to do, um, but actually, you know, what I believe is that uh, we'll take the time to work on deep online pedagogy and the technical pieces aren't going to be wildly different. Google Meets is getting more features, but a lot of that's going to be pretty similar. Google Classroom is there at the, at the primary grade levels. Uh, based on staff feedback, we did look into Seesaw, which is a much more user-friendly tool at the primary grade levels. But uh, really what the, the professional development we're looking for is how do we support staff and humanize the virtual environment? How do we help them build um, strong relationships with students they may not have met before, and how do we prioritize relationships and student support in that setting? Uh, secondly, uh, and I think this is really important, and I know it's going to sound jargony, but wayfinding. How do we learn how to build engaging, navigable, and student-centered online learning experiences, especially for our most vulnerable learners? Uh, one of the things we know is that uh, for all learners, uh, this was a new experience working in a virtual space. And much like our schools, if you walk into a school, there's a sign. And if you walk into a classroom, you'll see learning objectives and you'll see what the homework assignment is. And students know where to find things. That was really difficult last year. Uh, and we wanna provide really in-depth training for our staff in that way. Uh, third, third really critical piece is student agency. How do students take ownership of their learning and increase the engagement? One of the things that we continued heard in the student survey was really clear on this, was that engagement went down as students went into a virtual environment. And so again, we wanna make sure that we're training our staff, uh, offering professional development, that we can be much more engaging for students. And the th same thing we want in person, we want students owning their own learning. You've heard that a lot, uh, particularly at the elementary level. If you look at the their school improvement plans, for those of you in, who, who work in the elementary districts, you, you remember that from last year, that that's a critical component. And we really wanna work on what does that look like in an online environment. And finally, what do assessments look like? How are we getting formative assessments? There are some advantages um, about how assessments could work in a virtual space. And so that's really some of the foundational work that we have planned. Uh, we are planning for staff before the school year. Uh, we wanna work with people who have been virtual teachers before and to do this. Um, and it, it, Mr. Mio, I see your hand if it's okay with the chairs. I'd just like to finish because I'll, I'll be done in a second with this part of the 
superintendent update. Um, and I know I'm going on longer than I usually would, but I, I think there were a number of questions from committee members, so I wanted to go into detail. So, you know, we're really looking to develop clear models that include the DESE requirements um, and include a high focus on small group synchronous calls as well as asynchronous mini lessons consisting with the guiding principles. If you go back to those guiding principles, really it, it, there's a lot of um, the, they are what they are. They're the guiding principles that are helping us develop models. Uh, we're not looking at a model that would have student screen time being six hours a day. I want to be really clear about that. We're also not looking at models that would have screen time being one hour a day. We're trying to find that right balance of asynchronous lessons, synchronous calls, and student work uh, that allow for the right balance. Um, and, and so that, that's really what we're looking for. But I think the thing, if there's one take home for folks who are watching, significantly more direct instruction, significantly more structure and predictable structure, uh, and smaller group sizes. Those are the, the really big takeaways that we want to do and we want to support our structuring the day where our staff can be more successful with that. We'll have more soon on that, um, and, but I wanted at least, I felt like there was enough questions where I wanted to give a little more thorough um, sharing. Uh, probably even if we meet next week, I'll be able to share much more details on that, but I, I at least wanted to share a broad overview of the work because so much of our work I think rightfully so, has been focused on all the health and safety pieces of being in school. Um, and when all the plans include a significant number of students being in remote, you know, I was remiss in not sharing it, but we're all trying to do lots of things uh, simultaneously here. So forgive me on that. And I'm open to any questions on that before um, I have a couple other things to share on the update. And um, uh, Mr. Menino, and then Ms. Barlow. I infer from your comments that the person doing the direct instruction will also be doing the distance learning. I've asked this question before because I'm concerned about, you know, how many days a week do we expect a teacher to teach? Yeah. So um, the in our phasing models, there would be no one who would be doing both unless they request to do both. There are some related service providers who have indicated and, and some, some very um, specific roles who have indicated that they might be interested in coming in for some students while working with other students virtually. But in terms of the core instruction, like the second grade teacher, the second grade teacher uh, would be either teaching virtually uh, or teaching in person on a day. They wouldn't be both like, you know, and I'll be clear, I think I've said this before, but I want to be really clear because I'm convinced of it that we wouldn't have like cameras set up in the room where some students would be accessing live teaching and some students would be accessing the distance learning because they're different pedagogies. They're different instructional models. And so there has to be, staff have to do one at a time or another. They can't do both, in my opinion, effectively. I think you end up meeting no kids needs if you're trying to do that. Um, so I feel really strongly on that topic. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thanks for the clarification. Mr. Demley? Yeah, so I think from a parent perspective, um, these updates are gonna uh, are gonna top out until we get to a point where we can, where you or or the teachers or the principals can say, okay, specifically detailed, what is this going to look like? I think at this point, people get that we acknowledge that emergency learning wasn't what we want for the fall and that we're going to make it better, but what is that? And so I don't know if you could talk about schedule at this point, whether that will be part of the public forums. And also this, this notion of parent training, I understand that like the communication, the engagement will be better. And we don't expect parents to be teachers per se, but you know, we've, we've mentioned before that as the grades get younger, the need for parent support gets higher, right? And so um, uh, what, what are we expecting of parents uh, of, of those 90% of kids that are gonna start um, the school year uh, full, fully remotely? Yeah, so um, I think the schedules will probably be able to get to next week at the secondary level. Um, I don't anticipate them looking wildly different than the three by three block. The nice thing about that model is it allows for more dedicated focus. Um, so it works, uh, I think from a public health perspective, in my opinion, it works, it's the best model, but also from a distance learning, I, I also believe it's the best model. Uh, at the elementary level, I think it's a little more complex and, and we met about it this morning as I referenced, um, that was the primary focus of our meeting. And I think by next week, we should have at least some mock-up drafts. Um, of, of what that might look like. Um, the alignment piece in particular at the elementary level is something we uh, feel really strongly about improving on. Uh, so I think the second question you asked is about the parent training and I'm not trying to be, uh, uh, I don't know the right word. 
I'm not trying to be difficult, but I think I would I would offer caregiver training as the term because one of the things that's going to be really different than the spring is that many families won't be able to stay home. It may be older sibling. Uh, you know, in the spring, the vast majority of families were home. That will not be true in the fall. And so we do want to do parents guardians absolutely, but we're going to broaden that term because uh, we we know that that's not the case. Uh, and, this, and we've heard from families, and we know that just people are having to go back to work um, and many more than we're, we're home in the spring. So we do want to do, again, that wayfinding, and that's both a student piece, but also an adult piece as well. Um, and, and I think that's where we get into the conversations about what's the appropriate kind of learning management system at the primary grades versus when we get even to middle to upper elementary and beyond. Um, and we heard that from staff last year, loud and clear that, you know, Google Classroom you know, some people felt more effective, but for, for students, you know, who are going to be in the, I mean, just being candid, they're going to be in the realm of being more responsible. Uh, and I don't mean responsible because we're asking, but they're going to be, they're going to have to be because more families are going to be back at work and there's going to be, you know, caregivers that may not be parents, guardians, they may not be siblings, it may be, you know, um, more typical childcare providers uh, who are in the role. So we want to make sure that we're uh, offering a lot of training for, um, for all caregivers, but also uh, trying to make things accessible for students. We know at, at K to 12, that was really hard. Uh, and that's not a critique of teachers. That was the fact that we were in an emergency situation with like 72 hours to plan for it. And then once you set up that structure, you sort of have to live with it. It's really hard to change those structures once you're in them. And, and that's the really great thing about having those days before the school year is being able to set up those structures, having them be consistent across schools uh, and across districts so that we can, uh, we can really provide both synchronous and asynchronous training for caregivers um, and it could be that caregivers change, but if we're recording those trainings, uh, that they're accessible for all. Any other questions on this, this first part? Ms. Spitzer. Um, just one question about the remote learning option. Um, you know, when, when we're delivering stuff in person, it's building based and the staff you have at the building is the staff that you have, but in thinking about these remote options, is there any thought of using staff to kind of cut, cut across, because there are going to be some students who are going to be remote for the entire time, regardless of what phase we, we, we choose. So are we going to, are we looking at ways to kind of across, and maybe even districts, like I, I'm not sure about like Pelham and Amherst, if there's even a possibility that somebody living in Pelham could be doing remote learning with an Amherst teacher. I, I'm just curious about how, now that we don't have the constraints of building, are we, are we going beyond that at all? Yes. The short answer is yes. We're looking at models. I can't give you great details, but you know, our meeting this morning, of course, was inclusive of Lee, um, our principal at Pelham, and uh, we absolutely want to do that. And, and one of the things that at the elementary level in particular, uh, the concerns around alignment were very real, and our elementary teachers teach, with, mo with few exceptions, all the subjects. And so I think from a staff support perspective, we also have to be really realistic. We're expecting, last year we were expecting power standards, very low key, half of what we normally would do. That is not the case this year. And we, to be successful, in my opinion, we're gonna have to be collaborative. We're gonna have to work as teams and we're gonna have to have more discrete roles for individuals across grade levels, across schools and across districts. Um, and I think you, you highlighted two of them than we have before because space, the place doesn't matter, right? Um, we wanna retain that school feeling. We want people to have familiar adults that they see every day that are predictable. We don't wanna make elementary kids have high school schedules where you know, every period they're with a different teacher, but we believe there are ways where we can be successful in doing that. And actually I think harnessing our resources that way is gonna be much better for students and much better for our faculty and staff um, because it, it's really a different model. Uh, and we're really looking at, you know, can we develop asynchronous lessons that are actually shared? Right. The, you know, I had a, a middle school teacher, for instance, share an anecdote last spring where, you know, there were four or five staff members all recording the same reading of the same passage that they were going to teach in their class. That's a really inefficient use of time. Um, you know, that the like there, it would be much more efficient if one person was recording that and everyone else was planning their synchronous follow up and, and more mini lesson than that. And we have to be working collaboratively. Um, I think, you know, talking to uh, schools that have been doing this a long time as their core mission, uh, one of the things they say is you really have to break down those virtual walls because you're not in a building anymore. And so, so much of our focus is we're in school buildings, there's literal or figurative walls that get built. 
And we really have to take those down if we're going to be serious about providing uh, all the curriculum that we need to do and we need to support kids and families. So sorry, long-winded answer to, I could have just said yes, um, but I actually think it's a really important point that this should, this ought to look different than it did last spring and not just in the emergency ways, but we really do need to have more discrete roles and, and more collaboration uh, because we have a lot of staff and we're, we're staffed to be in buildings. That's the way we define our staffing. And so if we're going to be staffing uh, with the same staff to be in a virtual environment, we really need to change roles and responsibilities pretty significantly uh, to be effective. You know, virtual schools wouldn't have our staffing model, you know, uh, and that's not a knock that's saying, saying we have too many staff. This is nothing about budget. It's that they wouldn't define roles that way because it's not structured that way. And so for us, we need to think really differently about that. And we're starting to have those conversations. And again, if you go back to those guiding documents, um, guiding principles document, they talk a lot about different forms of collaboration and teamwork. So none of that, none of what I'm saying is new. It was really in that document, you know, all the way back in June. It's just more expanding on it. Any other comments, questions? I just got a, a, a message that the feed is out and that um, from somebody watching outside the meeting. Is anybody else getting messages about issues with the feed? Okay. On TV or online? Um, not sure. I, I don't know why okay. I, I don't, I'm not, I don't have any messages, but maybe that would be helpful okay. for media to know. I'll find out and, and I'll put it in the chat. Sorry to interrupt. So if I could uh, go on. So this is a little bit of an awkward. I have a little bit of a, a sharing and, and it's because the meeting got canceled Tuesday night because of the storm and how many people were out of power. Speaking of feeds going. Um, and um, so I know you're both talking about phasing and the larger document. Um, and, and those are interrelated, but I think I'd rather make a, a bit of a statement now, if that's okay with the chair, because um, I think they feed into that next conversation. Uh, I know there's things in between those, but I just think it, it makes sense. So, you know, what's presented tonight um, is the result of working collaboratively with the school committee over the last few months to develop a lengthy document that was in the packet. I apologize how lengthy the document is, but there's there's a lot there. Um, and, and so, um, just a couple notes that we are adding a little more robust section on ELL programming. Just, you know, we tried to get, it's 47 pages or 45 pages of text plus all the presentations. And we got as far as we can get uh, for tonight, but uh, please know that there is more on ELL coming. Um, I think also supposedly Desi's offering feedback on the initial, the quick plans that were submitted. Um, so I don't know what that will say. Um, but I wanna say, I understand how challenging this is for everyone. Um, and you know, the goal is to develop the best plan possible based on the direction of the school committee, whether that's what we've prepared for tonight or whether there's a school committee, you know, offers different advice and, and the staff from the administrative staff, you know, we're looking for direction um, so that we can do our job to make sure we're planning effectively for students. Um, I know the situation's evolving and decisions have and will continue to evolve along with it. And if changes are needed in the document, I'll be ready to make them. So I do think, you know, I, I don't want people to feel like um, the document's done and, and therefore the school committee uh, has no opinion. That's far from the case. It's that we have a timeline when we need to submit to DESE uh, and we needed to prepare something for you to respond to. Um, but I, I got some feedback and I just wanted to be really, really clear that um, this has been, I think will continue to be a partnership between the, the staff and the school committees. Uh, I know there's three separate school committees on the call and you, they, three school committees may have three different opinions. It's happening in some other multi-district uh, organizations like ours. And, uh, you know, I just want to share that, you know, we're dedicated to doing the best possible within the school committee guidance that we receive. Uh, so I want to share a few things that are really clear to me. So the situation will continue to evolve with the public information, public health information. You know, tonight's not an end, uh, whatever happens, but really it's a place to offer formal direction so we can be prepared. Um, and I think you all agree with that. I know you've shared it in the past. We certainly do. And, and we follow, you know, all of us follow every single day what's going on in Massachusetts and then you know every Wednesday what's going on in our towns and, and Western Massachusetts in particular because it breaks it out a little more every week. The second is there's no great decisions to be had, right? If there was, all the school committees across the state would be making the exact same decision and it, that doesn't seem to be happening. Um, and it's really trying to make the best decisions available given 
the information you have, and no decision will be as good as the worst decisions school committees have made in the past, right? That, that there's, you know, it really is trying to make the best of it. And so I want to say that publicly because I know there's a lot of advocacy and some of it, you know, within public comments, you've received other emails and lots of different opinions, and you're in a really difficult situation. And I want to acknowledge that publicly, um, that some people have come to me like, oh, you know, you've such a terrible job to be superintendent during this time. And, and perhaps that's true, but I feel like um, your, uh, your jobs are really hard to be decision makers uh, on th these weighty issues. And so wherever you all land, I just wanna acknowledge, and, and hopefully the public will as well, that I know how many emails I get and phone calls from you all, and I know how seriously you're taking this. And I wanna publicly acknowledge that. I think that uh, not so much fun on the third one, but there's, there's wider disagreement on these issues than any other topic in my 19 years in the district, and that all 19 years were in Amherst, Pelham, or the region. So that's saying something, and, and so I just wanna acknowledge that there's really diverse thoughts and opinions you know, on this matter. And, and, and on that topic, there's a group of Rhode Island superintendents who came out with a, a letter that I thought was good, but there's one particular section I wanted to read, uh, and I'll quote them. In the midst of all this uncertainty, one thing remains certain. And that is that no two households are identical. Every family and employee in our school districts has a unique set of circumstances, needs, resources, supports, employment conditions, socioeconomic realities, medical history, and myriad other variables. These factors underscore our need to focus deeply on equity in all of our proposals and decisions. And I, I really like that because it really describes some of what the diversity of opinions that we continue to receive or I do. And it also underscores the challenges of the situation logistically and educationally. You know, we've been committed to supporting this process to the best of our abilities and moving forward is critical at this juncture in time. And the last thing I wanna say is that I keep coming back and I've talked about it before to the key concept for me of humility. I consider all the different perspectives. I know that you all do as well. Those that come through public comments, come through phone calls, come through private emails and come through, uh, you know, all the different ways that we receive that feedback. And my commitment and our commitment, our administrative staff's commitment uh, through your guidance tonight and beyond is to be part of developing the best plan possible for students. And, and that's what our commitment is. And so uh, we're really looking for this guidance. You know, when we go through those documents, I'm happy to answer any questions of what's in the documents, what's not in the documents, other thoughts you have, and we'll try to give you the best guidance that we have and best information you have. Um, there is no certainty, you know, and I think that is, you know, really the hard thing and the only certain as, as I like the Rhode Island superintendents is that we're gonna make the best, uh, whatever decisions you all make, um, we're, gonna do, we're gonna do the best thing that we can for kids. And we just you know, collectively feel for you uh, as decision makers on this topic. And I feel like wherever you land, uh, wherever that is, whether it's consistent with what's presented tonight, whether it's different from that, um, you know, I just want to say for myself, I really know how deeply and seriously you're taking all these issues and you're weighing them. Um, and I really thank you all for the service. Other than Brenda, no one signed up for this. Brenda, you know, you sort of did from how you joined the committee. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, perhaps Bethany as well. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, there's no uh, pandemic policy that you can go back to in the school MASC guidebook and say, oh, yes, during a pandemic, this is the obvious decision making tree and it's really hard and and I just I, I know uh, you get a lot of competing uh, feedback from from folks uh, and I just wanted to really publicly acknowledge that and I'll stop here but I, I just think it was worth saying um, to all of you thank you um, <laughs> sorry I, I I lost it listening to that. So, <laughs> um, great. Uh, I think, uh, are you, so, um, Ms. Lord. Hello. Thank you. I just have a quick question for, um, Dr. Morris. Sure. And that's around clarification as a new school committee member. What we're voting on tonight is the plan that we're sending to DESE. We're still, right? We're not voting on what happens September 16th because there's still metrics and things we're going to have to figure out, or, or am I incorrect? Right. So I think between tonight and September 16th, a couple of things happen. One is that, um, you know, and I'm not going to speak to specifics about that because that'd be inappropriate, but there's bargaining that needs to happen with our, our units. Um, and public health data may change. And, and I think I'll speak to that a little bit when we get into uh, some of the phasing models 
uh, you may see that I added some, some, and I'm not saying it's draft. It's, you, you're responding to it for the first time. So uh, I think on both fronts, there are lots of work to happen between now, but what I'm hoping we get tonight with a vote is what gets submitted, which is a direct a direction. And I you know, was in a conference call with the commissioner today and he was really clear about that. The public health data, and they have not set, um, the state may or may not set public health guidance uh, around opening schools and phasing. Uh, I pr propose some draft language that it's just a proposal based on what I'm seeing from other experts in the field, um, but certainly you could set um, set that. Um, and you know, again, if if the committees make a decision that's inconsistent with the document that uh, was presented, uh, that's fine. And I'll do some quick editing. And um, again, you know, administratively, uh, not that we don't have opinions, but we're going to make what the school committees decide work uh, to the best of our abilities. And if that involves um, the decision that you want to support that document. Great. If it's that I need to edit that document based on a vote tonight, that's what we'll do, um, and and that's that's how we work collaboratively with the committees. Does that help answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Sure. Any other uh, questions from uh, for the superintendent? So I saw there was some questions about. Um, whether the streaming is working well. I'm sorry, I was in the middle of my spiel, so uh, I didn't pick up on that, but I don't know if that issue is resolved. I just want to make sure that we're sharing that publicly. Um, and if the issue is resolved, great. If not, you know, I just want to make sure Amherst Media is aware if there is any issues so that we can communicate it to them because none of us on this call can solve that problem. Um, I. Uh, I think Mr. Demling and Ms. Spitzer are the ones, and, and Ms. Kenny or Barlow, I'm not sure, have been receiving the me messages. Mr. Demling? I think the only thing that we can say definitively is that we have some reports that the streaming is not working. We have some reports that the streaming is working, so. I just got an update from the person who initially texted me to say it wasn't working online, and now about a minute ago it started working. So it sounds like maybe Amherst Media was able to troubleshoot and solve the problem. So thank you, Amherst Media, if that's indeed the case. Yep. Thank you. Any anything else for the uh, superintendent on his update? Seeing none. Um, in terms of the chair's update, um, I think all of us um, have received uh, the flyers and, and, and seen that, but there's um, on Saturday, uh, the district and we are hosting an information session for families in the South Point area, and that will be outdoors. Um, I, I can't remember exactly where, um, where it's going to be held, but it's Saturday at 10 a.m. for residents of um, the uh, regions um, around South Point. And the flyer that was posted by the district includes all of the, the um, uh, neighborhoods that are uh, included in that, for that information session. Um, the other announcement is um, a flyer will be published um, shortly for, um, great, <laughs> uh, streaming is working again. Um, that there will be a town hall information um, session and Q&A on Wednesday. Um, I believe we it's at 5.30. I'm sort of looking at Dr. Morris and Carrie and Ms. Spitzer um, with some healthcare medical professionals um, from the region. Um, and so that flyer will be um, published very soon, if not already. Um, and that is open to everybody in the district. Um, these uh, four or five medical professionals will be um, will share some insight on uh, COVID-19 and then answer questions that families might have when, as they're um, thinking about uh, the fall and um, returning to school or not. Um, so that is on Wednesday. Um, that is all I have. Ms. Hall, do you have any uh, chair's update? Um, from I don't, not tonight. Thank you. And now we move on to uh, school committee announcements. Are there any other announcements? Ms. Lord. I would like to invite everyone to our school equity task force meeting on Wednesday, August 19th at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any other announcements from the committees? Any of the committees? Mr. Harrington. Not so, not so much an announcement, just but just to uh, clarify the location of the event Saturday in South Point. The easiest way to say it is if you're, you're in this area, it's near the mailboxes. It's the, the open green area, which is right next to the mailboxes. Thank you. Any other announcements from um, anybody in the committees? Not seeing any. Okay. Um, so we'll move on to our uh, new and continuing business. And um, our first item is um, postponed from Tuesday, our um, fall 2020 phasing models. Um, and those uh, phasing models and updated version was in our packet. Um, we looked, we saw briefly some the, uh, presentation from, uh, actually, I can't remember which date. It probably was just last week, but um, <laughs> where we looked at the phasing models. And so, um, that and the survey responses are in our packet. Um, Dr. Morris, I don't know if you would like to introduce the, the survey and phasing. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I think I'll present if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's in the packet, but I just think it's easier for me to talk through. There it is. There we go. Is that visible? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is just the results straight out of SurveyMonkey of the phasing model, but um, I organize it by each. Um, I disaggregated by family responses, um, middle school, high school, student responses, staff responses, and then the aggregate. So if you remember, phasing model one was the most aggressive uh, phasing model with the shortest amount of time between going from phases, um, uh, going from phase groups. Um, and so uh, model two uh, differentiated between elementary and secondary. So the elementary models were a little more aggressive. The secondary was, was um, slower and model three was uh, the slowest phasing. And so you could see the results of the family responses um, the way at the right side, this is just the way SurveyMonkey does it, is it assigns um, a score of three points for a first place vote, two points for a second place vote, and one point for a third place vote. And, you know, I think like my comments earlier, I'm sorry if people didn't hear them, there's such diversity of opinions. So, you know, the phase in model one, 50% of families responded that that was their preferred and then 40 basically 40 percent said it was at least preferred it's not often that we get that spread uh you know on that but um this would the, these were the results of the family responses uh, these were middle school high school student responses we did not ask elementary students this um and you could see they, they very well aligned with with many of the other responses where there's you know real diversity they're a little more muted actually than some of the other responses in terms of uh, some of uh, those, but uh, you could see some real differences. I think it's worth noting because um, I got this feedback by email as well that we didn't ask about not coming back, but you know, anecdotally, if you look at the comments, um, a lot of those folks chose phase in model three about not coming back in the fall because it was the slowest phase in. Um, the, here's the staff responses. Um, so there's 149 responses uh, or 147, excuse me, that answered this question. And you can again see um, the staff responses. There was a different spread on the staff responses um, than um, the students and the families, but um, kind of interesting to look through uh, on that, uh, especially when you calculate the scores or it gets calculated. And here's the all responses. Um, and so again, I'll, I'll leave it to you to do some of the interpretation of that, but um, here, you know, that was the results. Uh, there was no way to qualitatively uh, capture the feedback, um, or we struggled to because it was so divergent or so diverse in terms of the feedback on the phase and models. Um, it ranged, I think, from folks who felt like kids, all kids should be back right away, and they were discouraged that there was phase and models to begin with, to folks who expressed that you know there no phase and model felt sufficient or safe to them, and. And that was true in every single group. That was true in, in the responses from students, the responses from staff, and the responses um, from families. So uh, we didn't have a qualitative spread because, or, or summary, because the themes were that people feel really differently. Um, and that was, that was essentially the theme. Um, so um, I, 
want to pause there and then before I get into um, some uh, revised model based on the feedback and some metrics. Yep, uh, Dr. Morris, we're, um, uh, we're, I'm seeing in chat and, um, and, and the like that we're still having issues with streaming. Um, so I don't know, and it seems to be the streaming, I think is, is what everybody's saying. So um, I don't know if there's anything we can. So what a nice option. We can't do anything about it. So I do want to just say out loud that yes, this is being recorded um, and will be available um, through Amherst Media's website um, and YouTube. So we did this before. So maybe if uh, what happened before, it didn't solve the issue, but I think it did help when I didn't share the screen. Okay. Is it okay if I, it's going to be a little more wordy, but if I describe things orally, um, because this is in the packet, this is all information that's on our website uh, in the packet, yeah. uh, people hopefully have access to it. And um, and I think um, if, if the committee's okay, I'd prefer to talk about it orally than have people who are streaming it not have access. Yes, agree. So why don't I stop there and see if there's questions about the data? Ms. Um, I just wanted to confirm there was no way to see about differences at like the elementary versus the middle school, high school level. I mean, I know the students were exclusively elementary, high school, but in terms of grade level, that we, or not grade level, but like elementary versus middle school, high school, we couldn't see a trend that way, could we? Um, I would, I'm just thinking back. Um, it seemed like the trends were in unrelated to grade level. That that really it's yeah, I think that's as much as I can say that you know, there weren't clear trends that way about phasing models, even though the phasing models did have different implications, especially phasing model two to three, it did have different implications elementary to secondary. Um, I think, you know, there was a lot of uh, this question as proxy for whether I would send my child back to school for the parent one, or I would choose to come back as a student. Um, that's my own interpretation, but I, I did feel like there was a lot of, um, that was driving a lot of the responses. Ms. Dancer? Um, I would just like to offer a comment in reading through uh, the qualitative parts of the survey, I felt like a number of people inferred that by only saying there were these phasing models that we were disqualifying remote learning or online learning. So that's a little bit of a concern to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Any other Questions or comments? Mr. Demling? Yeah, I mean, I just, just general comment. I mean, I, in, in terms of, so this was a lot to get through in terms of the survey content. So we obviously are not presenting the 200 plus comments that we got back from the survey, which thank you, Dr. Morris, for not presenting them as part of the slides. But, um, but that was a huge piece of this feedback. We had over a thousand respondents. Um, so um, um, uh, I'm glad actually we had a little bit of a delay so that we could get through that. Um, and, uh, I mean, you know, it's just, I don't know how other committee members have, you know, um, experienced the digestion of this as, as a piece of the, the whole public, um, input, um, you know, uh, experience, but, you know, I, I kind of look at it as, as like another piece of the puzzle, right. And, and all these various ways that the public has of expressing, um, their preference are are all limited and have their own advantages and disadvantages uh, in different ways, right? Of like like public comment and emails, um, and like all surveys, this is limited. It didn't reach ev everyone. I, I don't look at this as like a firm conclusion of like what everyone thinks. Um, but but the number of responses is is pretty good. You know, 120 staff is is pretty good sample size. Over 700 parents is is very good sample size. So I, I wouldn't draw like super exactness from it, but like when I look for clear trends, um, it's, I, I find it pretty helpful in terms of seeing, um, you know, one, what, what, what superintendent noted, which is within each of those groups, the parent 
I'm, so, I'm sorry, the family group, the, um, the staff group and the, and the student group, um, that there's pretty strong disagreement among even, even what the top preference is, right? Even, even if you look at the most extreme case of, um, of what the top preference is of the, of the, uh, the family, uh, of where, where model one, model one only has 50% support. That means that half of all the family respondents of those 700 plus respondents preferred something other than model one. And, you know, those are, those are mutually irreconcilable, right? And, and same thing with, with, with staff and, and student preference. Um, uh, and so those, so, so that's very hard to resolve. Um, and, and then the other, the other big take home for me was how much model two stood out as as this compromise choice in the middle. So when, like when you look at the percent choices, uh, I'm sorry, the percent numbers for model two as the second choice, it's it's really like the runaway favorite. Um, you know, with with the with the percentage, um, you know, 72 percent with the family and 69 percent with the staff. And then um, you know the the, the thing I, I looked at was if, if you look at you know if if model two is one of your top two choices, it's it's even more extreme. It's 99% of staff, um, model two is either the first or second choice and 91% of families model two is either the first or second choice. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot more to be said about, about the models and, and the different variations and, you know, we'll get into that. But I just, from, from a survey point of view, um, as a piece of the puzzle where, where we don't want to be drawing super exact Conclusions. I, th I thought that that general trend standing out so strongly among those three groups, as that compromise piece was was pretty notable. I, I just want to add. I think you know, going this kind of builds on Ms. Spitzer's um, comment or, qu or question about sort of the breakout between elementary and secondary, because I. I um, well, I agree that the vast majority, um, you know, chose model two as their second choice for for parents um, or families with only secondary students. There's no difference between model two and model three. Um, so in a way, you know, it's without knowing sort of the difference between, you know, how, how folks were thinking about their, their individual students, it's hard to say that two is, um, uh, it's, a, it's a compromise for elementary families, I would say, because those those um, for an elementary um, for elementary students, there's definitely a difference, a big difference between one, two, and three. Um, but I don't, and I, 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 being a little selfish there, because I have my kids are in secondary schools, and so I'm like, well, two or three doesn't really matter um, from a per from my family's perspective. Um, are there any other questions or comments on the data? Uh, Ms. Ms. Lord. Um, yes. I think what I got some feedback from reading that was that maybe people also wanted the choice of remote learning. So just to present that this is saying one or two because, or three, because those were the only choices. Um, and that's why there was confusion. Like, are we, yeah, just saying there wasn't the choice to say all remote. Or go ahead, Dr. Morris. Oh, I'm not yeah. sure. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. Dr. Hey. Morris. <laughs> um, no, I think that's right. And and we had lots of internal conversations, and we intentionally didn't ask that because that would be a separate question on a separate survey. And just because a family or a staff member or somebody would believe it should be all remote, that we didn't want to preclude them or exclude them from being able to weigh in on what the best phasing model might be. Right, so so it actually I think would have shifted the da data if we had that option, uh, and that's a different question. But once you do that, then all of a sudden you don't get to vote on phasing model that you think might be the best. And so you know one could argue it either way, but we do intend if, if there's an in-person and a virtual model after tonight, we intend to survey families next week. Uh, actually, you know perhaps even on Saturday and bring some paper copies to the event uh, because families will be there and it might be convenient for them. Um, to ascertain what their thoughts are and what they would choose to do. Um, so I think we want to get to that, but we didn't want to exclude them from a data source. And that's sort of what would have happened. Um, and um, I think then we would also wanted to ask, have asked different questions on our survey. So one could argue it either way, but I think it is, 
you know, basically when I look, because I get access to all the data, if you look at who voted for question three and who made those comments, or who made those comments that you're talking about, Miss Lord, they almost exclusively voted for phasing model three. Um, that's not to suggest there aren't people who voted for phasing model three who don't have that, but I do think that served as proxy to a certain extent for folks who had that opinion. And um, we just didn't want them to be excluded from the data set. Uh, and we also didn't want to ask what felt like next week would be a binding question to families and to ask it twice in two weeks didn't feel so wonderful for us. And it's a super valid point. I'm not trying to be defensive. I'm just trying to explain the rationale. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Oh, Ms. Um, so I think I'm a guess I'm a little confused about what we're doing with the voting or the if we are going to vote on phasing and how that relates to finding out who would prefer the virtual method. Can, can you explain how those relate to each other? Sure. Um, so, um, yeah, so this felt better when it was spaced out over two meetings. So I want to acknowledge that point. And so the idea is if the school committees, what, any of the school committees vote tonight to move forward with a plan that offers the option of in-person, we would then survey families in short order um, to see what they wanted to do. And that's part of what the town hall that, you know, that, that Ms. McDonald spoke about, uh, because we need, then need to know what staffing we need in person versus distance as well. Just because we offer an in-person option doesn't mean that all students have to take it, right? The families have an option of, of, being, um, of, of choosing virtual education for their child. Um, and so I think the vote tonight, it's a little bit murky for me about how you do that because um, they're sort of, they, they blend into one another in, in perhaps some awkward ways that they wouldn't have if they were in two other nights. And I'm sure someone smarter than me like Ms. McDonald will have a, a better answer to that question. Well, I don't, I don't know if I'm smarter than you, but, um, but I, I, I tend to think of it this way is um, if, if we go back, we've, we've been talking about plans and, and, and we've already voted on pieces of, of, of framework and guidance. Um, so if you go back to, it's in our deck, the framework that um, for, for learning for students um, that we voted uh, a few weeks ago in July, um, where we talked about the principles where we wanted to um, ensure staff and student safety. Um, we wanted to maximize in-person learning in the safest, uh, following our, our um, safety and health protocols. And we wanted to um, provide the, the best distance learning experience possible and then be flexible to adjust. So those were the four sort of high level principles that we had voted on and agreed. So this phasing model is, is with that in mind where we had said we wanted to maximize in-person learning. Um, we also, in that do document, we had provided the op option, as Dr. Morris referenced, that families could, families um, and students could opt for the full distance. So that doesn't go away by voting on the, on the phasing. This phasing model is specifically for that first piece about the in-person learning. So for families who would like to choose the in-person face-to-face learning, this is, this is the timing um, by which we've we would outline and sort of bring people back into the school building. In that framework, we also specifically requested this phasing in um, for that in-person learning. Um, one, to enable um, staff and educators to um, develop and, and, and practice and, and, and get the professional development and, and um, work that they need to do to learn the new protocols as well as teaching in the new environment. Um, we also talked about um, uh, the phasing um, in terms of the, the sort of slow build um, for practicing and ensuring sort of um, learning and adherence and, and um, comfort with uh, the new in-person learning protocols and transitions and et cetera. So I say all that, that's all um, just a recap of what we had. So this, this phasing is sort of one piece of that puzzle and the distance learning is still an option 
for any and all families. Ms. Spitzer. I think the tricky thing looking at this data, because I think if, like, if you wanted to calculate the standard, like I doubt there's a statistically significant winner in this. I think it's completely murky and we wouldn't actually be able to choose a winner out of these three options. Um, the, the thing about this, and I, and I fully, I want to acknowledge that I fully understand the reasoning that um, Dr. Morris presented about the way we've done this and that we haven't focused in on the people who are interested in in-person learning, but I think I'd be really interested to know that had we focused in on those who actually feel like they'd like to come in, I'm going to go out on the limb here and I'm going to say that they probably would have been the group that's more in the same way that you're saying like option three is kind of like the proxy for those who are not going to come into the schools until there's a vaccine or until the numbers are so low, um, you know, much lower than they are today. Um, and so the problem is that if we're designing this to meet everybody's needs, it's actually problematic because they have really different needs. So the person who doesn't have the option of, you know, has a small child and is a frontline worker and can't stay home with that kid is going to have a really strong preference probably for that faster model that is in phase, that, that, that first model one. And so I just want to acknowledge this is a tricky thing when we're trying to choose because it we don't actually know, did everybody who choose three, three, phase three, are they really just indicating that they're, they're not feeling safe right now and they want to delay it as much as possible and that's the reason that option felt safe to them? Or maybe they are interested in going back in person and the only way they feel that is if, if it is slowed down a lot. So it, it just, I just want to acknowledge for the committee that the, the, the data doesn't provide us a lot of guidance and it, and it feels like we kind of need to acknowledge that while we're making our decision. Mr. Demling? So, um, I mean, while I might not completely agree with Ms. Spitzer that the data is comp completely murky, um, I, I do feel like there's a, a general trend towards support for Model 2. Um, that being said, I do, I do agree with, with, with what the general point of, um, you know, the, one of the major limitations of a survey is that you don't know why people chose what they did. Um, and so you're, you're left to speculation. Um, and so it's, it's ultimately only a piece of the puzzle. Um, so I, I, th I think two other things that to bear in mind, at least that I'm trying to bear in mind as, as I'm um, uh, making my, trying to make my decision throughout this evolving conversation here, um, is, you know, there's, there's, uh, this is one piece of input into deciding what the phasing model ought to be and what the justifications for phasing are, right? Um, like, I mean, I think the two other big op uh, um, benefits of phasing that, that Mr. Morris is probably about to talk about, but, but we've, we've mentioned before, um, is, is that ability to, um, uh, to implement an operational system um, in the buildings that has never been done before, right? And so allowing uh, the building principals and the teachers and the facility staff um, a, a ramp up time with a small population and with the children that are going to need it the most, right? The most assistance to physically implement that. Um, to, to get that right. Um, that's, that's a huge benefit. The other huge benefit um, to phasing, and I don't think this has been mentioned enough, is, is to distance learning. You know, so we had the emergency distance learning in, in March, and we all want it to be distance learning 10.0 that we've talked about ad nauseum and that we're all anxious to see the details on. You know, the big thing that it needs, though, is a complete mental shift and total buy-in from everybody, all students and all teachers at the same time, and, and, and the beauty of, of, of the phasing model is that, is, is that it has nearly everyone, except for the phasing group students and staff, you know, that 10% that are there at the beginning, you know, for a solid month, everyone online in this completely new system, booting up in a totally new mental model, right, of this, of this new uh, system, not just the technology, but the new, the new ways, the, 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 new, the new synchronous, the new ways of communicating and, and all that. Um, I think that's, that, that's a tremendous benefit um, for the very reason we put in the framework document, which is, um, you know, it was a priority for our committees that uh, to that the district needs to prepare for the possibility that at some point, given the the, the metric conditions, again, I'm stealing Dr. Morris's thunder in a, another two slides, um, uh, we may need to go to full remote anyway, and so so we need to make sure at the beginning that that is a fully, you know, high, you know, ramped up uh, system. So I, anyway. Um, that, that, that's one point. The, the other thing that um, I think, um, and I'm trying to follow back on an important point that Ms. Stancer raised, which is 
how does this vote um, kind of Venn diagram overlap into the question of, of full remote? Um, and I, I guess so I'll leave it mostly to Dr. Morris to describe, but this, this goes right into um, the, the notion of, um, of establishing metrics as thresholds for going to these phases and including, including going to phase one. Um, I, I, th I think was was really key for me when it, when I read that slide. So um, uh, I, I'll stop there because I don't want <laughs> to get into that too much. But but to me, that's the really important pivot point. That that based on local conditions, the plan that, that as presented, you know, could be a fully remote model under under those those conditions, and that's why it is is so dependent on those local conditions. And then that, that that's why it's that um that uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just stop there. <laughs> I think if unless um, other committee members have questions specifically about the survey responses, it might be helpful if we let Dr. Morris talk about the next two slides where he introduces a new model as well as the the metrics. Are there any more questions specifically on the survey? Nope. Okay, Dr. Morris. Before we do, so I do this every now and then, I just want to give Ms. Gribko an opportunity. She never has to, and I don't know if she likes that I do this occasionally, but if she, um, and she may be frozen on her screen, I can't tell. Um, but if, you know, I always just want to encourage her to participate, but it looks like her screen is frozen to me. Um, Likewise, yeah. If she's hearing us and wants to jump in, I just always, you know, especially when it's, there's a student survey, she's not, responsible for the student survey, but if she wanted to offer her insights, I always welcome that. Um, so um, I'm going to just announce that this is on pages 12 and 13 of the agenda packet that's on our website, so that if people, I'm not going to share the screen since that seems problematic. Um, and um, and so, you know, one of the things I looked at based on the feedback um, was adding a model four, which had uh, priority groups um, a, the same uh, starting, in, you know, in mid-September. I actually shifted all these back to mid-September, given the change in the calendar. Um, for the elementary grade levels, it was the same, but we had more conversations with the secondary principals and Mr. Shadik's on the call. And the problem with starting with ninth grade or just ninth and tenth grade was that as opposed to the elementary level and even most people at the middle school level, though not all, at the high school level, people teach students in all grade levels and there's classes with students in all grade levels. So sort of as we started to um, kind of uh, actualize that model, we really started to get away from um, looking at grade level um, and, um, and then uh, thinking about maybe the, the phasing would be after the first quarter at the secondary level, one day a week, uh, and we could see how that goes and see if it could be expanded uh, after the first semester so that it would be, it would cut across all students at the secondary level. Um, I think from a staffing perspective, that made sense. And also from a student perspective, there were a lot of concern in the survey about, uh, particularly about um, juniors and seniors, uh, about the years, about preparing for college and, and all those sorts of things. So we tried to address that in a different model. I think one of the questions that um, I also received is why is the elementary and models two and four on a different model, different schedule than the secondary and actually goes back to some of the same thinking is that it's really hard to have ninth grade and then 10th grade and then 11th grade come in um, just because our teachers are teaching multiple courses and it goes back to actually the question Mr. Menino asked at the beginning are you teaching virtually or in person and it was hard to imagine how that was going to work with certain grade levels coming in and other grade levels not at the secondary grade level at secondary level uh, it was really hard to figure that out and also uh, a quarter is a good moment to pause and make a shift if we are because there are courses that shift in the quarter it's a marking period especially uh, in a block schedule it's the halfway point so it just the flow of it uh, and the logistics of it made much more sense to us the more we thought about it um, and certainly if there's any um, question about um, you know about that part you know either me or Mr. Sadiq Principal Sadiq and can comment, but that, that was the significant difference. Um, and, so, um, and so the other part was adding a metrics phase. The, the original draft of this just said based on public health data. Um, but if you look at page 13 in the packet, um, it just uses what's, what I'm seeing from you know, Johns Hopkins University and other medical professionals, um, fewer than 75 confirmed cases per 100,000 in the past seven days and a test positivity. Again, that'd be for Hampshire, Franklin County. 
and a test positivity rate below 5% in those counties. Um, New York is using the 5%. The American Federation of Teachers landed on that 5% and some language that I saw from them that doesn't, that's not our union in Amherst, um, but it is a national teachers union. And then having a, a higher standard for moving between phases that uh, having, you know, looking for, you know, lower numbers, it's hard to really describe this stuff numerically and then uh, casually uh, in, in my language, uh, but looking at 65 confirmed cases and lower than 4%. You know, this is something I'm certainly open to feedback on from, from anyone in, in the room. It, it is what I'm seeing as some standardized measures that people are uh, using around that. I think it's to Ms. Lord's point earlier. Um, I'm not trying to convince anyone these are the right numbers, but I think it is really important to have metrics if we are going to make changes. If we're planning for in-person and we're going to make a change between now and then, it should be based on you know, what the, the agreed upon metrics. I did check with the Amherst Health Department. I talked to a, uh, a physician at, um, through Harvard at Brigham and Women. So I tried to get as much concrete information from folks in the field that I could. I am not an epidemiologist. I don't claim to be. Um, but it, I tried to find what are some uh, other places doing. Uh, you know, the nice thing that what I, what I learned is um, the test positivity rate um, is actually a really good marker for um, whether test cap testing capacity is keeping up. Uh, and then the confirmed cases per 100,000 tries to get it at the spread. So they're, they're, they're related metrics, but you know, one might ask, are they the same metric, but they're actually related, but distinct enough where, in my opinion, having both of them uh, makes me feel more comfortable um, and that it would have to be a, you have to meet both of them. One of the questions I got, I know is, what if one of them's true, like the, the we're under 5%, but over 75 cases per 100,000. And I think it, it's, it's an and, not an or uh, from a public health perspective. So uh, again, that's the two things I added uh, from the last time was looking at the phasing model four and then also uh, metrics to help guide decisions. Um, and, and I think, you know, my personal viewpoint, whatever, wherever you all land tonight uh, is that Having clear metrics is going to be really important because I think if we're if our metric is something that's not based in public health, um, it's going to change every week indefinitely. Um, if like if our if our metric is is not public health related, this is a really hard situation. It's going to wax and wane, and you know uh, like all of us do uh, on these topics. So again, I'm I'm open to feedback on both the models and the metrics, but those are the the changes since the last time you looked at it. Can I ask a, a clarifying question back on the model four phasing? So if it's not by grade level, but it's one day a week, does that mean, can we infer that that means it's going to, the who's in on any particular day is determined by the courses as opposed to uh, you know, saying it's cohort A, cohort B, like cohort A are, are going to be people in these particular courses, like how does that, so I'll, uh, I don't know if Mr. Shadik, if I believe he's on, and if he wants to comment a bit on that, you know, we are looking at different models at the middle school level. One model would be seventh grade one day, eighth grade another day, and I think that was in some of the documents um, because it is a team model that is a little more possible than it is certainly at the high school level. So, um, Mr. Shadik, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but you agreed to be on the call, so there you are. Yeah, um, so it wouldn't be divided by courses. It would be literally divided, the school would be divided in half. We'd create the schedule. And so, and we'd have to think about what would be the best way to divide it. If it would just be splitting all the classes in half and having half of them there on one day and another half on another day, or if transportation-wise it made more sense to do it geographically. But it would it would be, my thoughts would be one of the two ways. Maybe alphabetically is another way we would do it, but it wouldn't be by subject so much. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, what questions or comments from the committee? I'm going to start with Ms. Kenny, and then and then Mr. Demling. Um, so, I actually just have a quick question. Maybe I missed it. I'm sorry. Um, so, the for the metrics. Where do those numbers come from? Mm -hmm. Like local hospitals? Where, where is that information coming from? So, uh, yep, it's a great question. So uh, one of the things that's easier is the confirmed cases per 100,000 is published every Wednesday. 
um, by county. So we have access to that really easily. At the current time, the test positivity rate is only by town. I've actually talked to some of our local representatives and, and actually uh, with the commissioner as well, there's a group of us that are advocating for countywide data. Um, because I'll give you an example. There's a town not in our district, a very small town in Franklin County. They had two positive cases this week because they had very few tests. It threw their average to be at like 7% positivity, which because it's so sensitive because there's so few people in the town that it could be literally siblings and then the number gets wacky. So we thought having Hampshire and Franklin County was the right right amount because it's not just, we have school choice, right? We have, we. It, it didn't feel like if we just looked at our four communities, you know, the more we thought about it, the metric need to be a little bit larger than that. Um, so we would have to do some math every Wednesday by looking at towns right now to look at all the towns in Hampshire and Franklin County uh, to get that. It's doable. It's a little cumbersome and hopefully uh, in short order, uh, it will be done for us by the state. But at the current time, we'd have to do it manually. Ms. Spitzer? Oh, sorry, um, Mr. Demling had his hand up first. So, Ms. Spitzer. No, I, I can go first. Okay, Ms. Spitzer. So, my comment was directly related to this question of how we're calculating that, because I think, would we take the average of the two counties? Like, that seems too simple. I think we'd have to, like, weight it somehow. And I, I think we'd want to just make sure we figure that out up front and publish it <laughs> somewhere. You know, like, these are the sources. This is how we're doing it, because, um, I think the problem is sometimes these numbers, like you just pointed out that case, they, they can be really sensitive and I'd hate to see all, us making um, really big changes in people's lives if the numbers move just a little bit and then go back one week to being another way. So as transparent as we can be and as robust in terms of like resilient to, to potential small changes would be useful. Dr. Morris? To respond to that just in terms of that we would we would uh like in terms of combining the hampshire county and franklin county data we would do it on the per capita basis so you know that's it seemed like that was the fairest way if we're averaging it's all on average that we would do that and in terms of the test positivity rate we actually you know again it's cumbersome but it can be done just adding up all the town's tests dividing by the positive rate so hopefully at some point the state does that for us they're not at the current time but um i just you know, wanted you all to um, be aware that we are thinking about how to do that in a way that's fair, that doesn't skew the data. So a Franklin County, because it's small, a lot smaller than Hampshire County, that it wouldn't have an undue effect. And yet, because two of our town, two of our four towns are in Franklin County, we feel like that's relevant data and we, we, we love our Shoots and Leverett people. Mr. Menino? Well, Mrs. Spitzer raised the question in my mind. Does this mean we can go back and forth a dozen times? We we beat the metric. We didn't beat the metric. We beat the metric uh, uh, in person, uh, 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 virtual, virtual uh, in person. How, how many times back and forth will we go? So I think that's a real concern, and yet. Um... That's why we were, you know, this training that I spoke about at the beginning of the meeting for distance learning would be for all staff, even staff who are starting the year in person, because we can't guarantee that, um, you know, that these numbers won't change. There's some things we can control. There's some things we can't control. Um, and, um, and that's true even for individual students who may start in person and choose to go virtual or vice versa, right? There's going to be, there's going to need to be flexibility on that. Um, but I do think what you're talking about is a real issue. And if we're getting close to whatever the metric ends up being, and, and I'm looking for feedback on this. I'm not, again, uh, I've checked in with, 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 with public health folks, but I don't claim to be all knowing uh, in this regard or any regard for that matter, um, you know, whether these are the right, right metrics that people feel comfortable with. But, but I think you're right right now, um, Mr. Mino, right now, uh, Hampshire and Franklin County are well under these metrics. Um, but there is a county in Massachusetts who would be over it, not by much, but a little bit right now, uh, looking at the data from yesterday, yes, Thursday, from yesterday. Um, it's not near us, but, um, you know, I think my personal belief is you develop metrics and you stick with them, even if it causes um, some challenge, because it would be just a little bit over, but I think a little bit over is over. So, you know, that's my perspective. I think when we get wishy, uh, that's not the right way, it was, and I'm not suggesting you were saying that, but... When we get flexible with our metrics, I think we run into lots of problems, in my personal view. 
I'm seeing um, several hands. Um, so I'm going to go to Mr. Demling because you've been waiting. Um, and then I see Mr. Harrington, Ms. Seeger, and Ms. Hall. So um, we'll I'll go in maybe that order. <laughs> Mr. Demling. Yeah, so um, back to model four. Um, I just want to say quickly two, two things about that that I liked about the variation um, uh, from, from model two is, you know, I, I like the idea of getting all kids back sooner. Um, you know, fr from like an equity piece and from like a social emotional point of view, you know, like the, the idea of not, I mean, I have to, I'll just, I just wanted to say this publicly once in our meetings, like the idea of not having eyes on all kids for, for like 10 months, like we went remote last March, right? So to go to late January to, for, for some of our kids not to be in the building for that long, that's, that's a concern of, of mine. And, um, and, uh, you know, we have, we have professional counselors, we have the Bright program, we have, we have teachers who even though social emotional counselor isn't on their name tag, that's, that's part of their, of their role, right? It's part of their DNA. And um, that, that connection that students have, um, and, and to not have that until late January um, was a concern. So, so thank you for that. I like that improvement. I also think from a safety point of view, it's, it's an improvement in terms of um, when we think about the, the cumulative exposure to peers as, as a variable in COVID, um, in, in COVID risk, uh, if you're going to go from zero to two days a week um, with your peers, that's different than going from zero to one and then a few months later to two, right? And so that, that gradual increase is also, is also a benefit. So, so I like that variation. Um, speaking to, to the main point I want to make though about the metrics slide. So I'm, and I'm, I'm taking sort of like notes furiously here about a point Mr. Menino made, specific detailed points about these suggestions and comments about the metrics about an appointment Spitzer made, uh, Ms. Kenny made. Um, and this kind of all comes back to a point that um, Ms. Lord made about, you know, we're, um, if we're potentially voting this, this phasing tonight and then this, this, uh, this plan document that, in, that includes this phasing, um, you know, there's, there's, there's things that we might be coming back to. And my, my expectation is that we would be able to revisit um, this, this, this part of it, not, not to be wishy-washy on metrics in terms of going up and slacking on them, but in terms of tightening them up, you know, because I, I just heard three really um, interesting, actionable things that we might want to investigate in terms of making these potentially stronger or more conservative. You know, because because you can think about turning the dial on these things, and um, you know, if if you read the data on phase one, if if there are more than seventy five confirmed cases in the model that you're proposing, this is a fully remote model, right? If if the test positivity rate is about is above five percent, this is a fully remote model because we're not meeting the benchmark for for our priority uh, phase one group. Um, so I th I think this is this is exactly the kind of focus for our committee's attention to be having. Um, for, for me, it's, it's, it's an absolute requirement. I wouldn't feel comfortable voting a phasing model without it because because it, it leads to exactly what you described, this kind of qualitative in the air of, well, how, how actually are you going to make the call, um, you know, when you're under all this pressure, um, you know, this irreconcilable preference pressure, you know, in the future. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable voting a model that includes this data, uh, provided that um, you know you you are open to the committee coming, you know, our committee revisiting this, uh, and that you're open to you know the, the committee potentially weighing in with with stronger metrics if if that's what the committee is uh, comes to a consensus on. So that's that's just my feeling on on that. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, so I, su I suppose this has been answered to an, to an extent. I'm just kind of looking for a, a tighter answer on it. So if, if over a, say over a two week period, we start seeing a trend, we're, we're not quite at that 5% number, but you know, one, one week, we'll say, I'll just take random numbers. One week we're at 1.5, the next Wednesday we're at three. Our, what exactly would our response be at, at that point? And, and how close to that metric do we need to be? Or do we need to have, or do we have to be over that number? In order yeah. to change. And so that this is the kind of feedback that we want to have. I saw Connecticut came out with some some models, um, and they 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 you know what I'm hearing from you, Mr. Harrington, is how do you build in like a delta model where the change is going to be included? 
what I didn't like about Connecticut's model is that it just was like a continuum. It didn't actually lead to a decision-making tree. It was like, you might want to go closer to hybrid or remote, right? And and I, I'm not, I don't live in Connecticut. I, I don't want to knock your home state, Mr. Harrington, but, um, but, you know, I think it was, I think my personal opinion is wherever we land, there's got to be a clear metric. And, and one could be, you know, if there's an increase of over 1% in a two week span or a one week span, that triggers X, Y, Z. Um, but I think just being really clear on metrics and having green, and I don't think we're gonna do that tonight. Um, I mean, maybe you all will, but I, I, you know, I think this is your first time looking at this and this is the first time we're discussing it. Um, but I do think it's really critical. Um, I think it's really critical. And I like the, improve, the, the Delta model that you talked about. I had trouble actualizing how that would, um, would that functionally work? But there's also lots of experts in our area, like, you know, that are gonna be in a session Wednesday that might be able to help us with that. Cause I think, I think you're right. It could still be low, but you know, a, a concern could be a big jump even if it's still under a number. And, and again, I'm not wet on four and 5%. That's again, what the numbers are in the field right now. I certainly am not opposed to committee members suggesting different numbers and, and having that conversation. I'm very open to it. Um, Ms. Seeger. With the metrics, I have a quick question and then I have a comment on the models. Um, with the metrics, I'm assuming that obviously we, we'd use the metrics to, to bring students back. Um, could we also combine that with the date? Is that the idea? Like, you know, we, we're not going to bring students back before September 16th. I mean, obviously because school's starting, but like the dates on the calendars that we're looking at would be part of it and as well as the metric. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, it, that it would be, it would have to be, both would have to be true. In order to return on X date, the metrics have to be, show that we're ready. And that's why for me, I set up higher metrics for the phases because I think we shouldn't do it. We should have, my personal opinion is we should have more stringent metrics if we're going to increase the number of students. It kind of gets at Mr. Harrington's point a little bit different way that mm -hmm. you have one metrics, what do we need to have to feel like it's open, it's safe for students to be in school and staff to be in school. I think we'd want to have a higher metric if we're going to say, okay, now we're going to include more people. Okay. Uh, that was, again, the numbers might change. I like the improvement metric and need a little help probably thinking about how to, how to draft that. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely the case that it would be, it'd be both. And, you know, I think when you get to a conversation later, I'll perhaps, um, not about phasing, but just in general, just I have some thoughts about why metrics are important, no matter what the decision you all make is tonight that, um, you know, uh, if we're not using metrics, then, well, I'll, I'll, I'll save it for that conversation. I apologize. Okay. The, and the comment I had on the models was, um, I'm personally uncomfortable with having anybody in the school and sp with the priority group starting on September 16th. Um, I'm wondering if as a group, if other people feel that way and like moving that group even out a little bit, because what that gives us an opportunity to do is to see how our community responds to this influx of college students like we won't know i think by september 16th what it's doing to the community um, and it just would give a little more breathing space to see if that positivity rate really starts to to climb up um just the thought i've had um let me come back to that and just in terms of a practicality from our agenda perspective because we are talking about the calendar later so i think that's that's where we want to well, okay. but these phases all have, they have dates in them, in a sense, middle of September, middle of October, middle of November. I mean, are those not strict in any sense, or? Dr. Morris? I think Ms. Fitzer had her hand up, so I'll, I'll defer to. Uh, Ms. Hall is waiting. So oh, Ms. Sorry. Hall and Ms. Spitzer, um, yeah. Okay, my, mine is just really quick, just on these, um, on the metrics, uh, could we say, can we say where they are today on these two or, or uh, whatever the most recent date is that we have for that information? Yeah, yeah, I can't, I don't have the specifics right in front of you, but I can give you the general. So okay. um, the number is around 2%. It's a little bit under, I believe, in Hampshire and Franklin County. And Ms. Spitzer's shaking, nodding her head, excuse me, not shaking her head. It, and that, that's doing, that's calculating it the same way, weighting it and doing it per capita. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the confirmed cases is, oh, shoot, 
I looked this morning and of course now it's gone, but it's, it's well under 50 um, between the two. Franklin County is lower than Hampshire County right now, <clears throat> excuse me, per capita. Um, but even probably if you give me three minutes, I can give you the exact numbers on those because those ones are the easy ones. They're published weekly. Um, so I can try to find that out as long as. No, not... Oh, I, I, w I wasn't looking for exact. I guess I just wanted a sense of scale of like what things would happen, say, between now and September 16th that would change some decision making. And I sort of. Uh, similar to Mr. Harrington's question about like see, seeing that delta and how that would impact decision making. So I just, for reference, I wanted it. So that's good. Thank you. Ms. Spitzer. Sorry, I, I wouldn't normally um, be bringing this up in the middle of a meeting, but um, UMass just announced that they are not bringing back students who are learning online to campus. So I this happened at 7.45 when we were in the minute, my phone's been blowing up a little bit about this. So I, I bring this up only because I think it is directly relevant to the conversation we're having because of the concern that Ms. Seeger just raised. Um, it, I wish, it, so this is, I, I just wanted to bring it to the full committee's attention in case anybody on the committee wasn't getting this news um, through their um, email and, and phones. Um, I do have other comments on the phasing. Um, can, yeah. Well, why don't you finish if you if finish and then we'll... I mean, so, so so my other thoughts about the the, the phase plan generally um, did I just mute myself sorry um, are that I was wanting to confirm that for the elementary piece with priority groups in September because they're on specific dates are we saying that K through one and grade two through three three would all be starting at the same block of time. Um, I wanted to confirm that. And then I, I think I just wanted to, to, to put out there that I, I personally don't see like, there's a model five that I would potentially like to see, which is one where we really prioritize the younger kids um, for in-person learning while um, kind of sticking with the, the, you know, more of the more model four option for the older um, students, just because I think for, the younger kids and I'm I'm really concerned about what's happening in November in terms of a return of influenza and cold virus you know other coronaviruses that we're used to um, just because I think the overlap of the symptoms of COVID and the symptoms of the flu and cold and the guidance that we've seen earlier is going to mean that a lot of students may not be getting COVID but they're going to be having a cough or a runny nose and we're not going to be allowing those kids for really good reason to be in school. So the idea that we're actually going to be getting fourth and fifth, sixth graders in on a regular basis in November to me seems um, unlikely. And I want them to be able to build a connection with their community in the school buildings, potentially prior to um, having to go remote only. Um, so I, I don't feel quite as strongly about that for the older students, because I do think they're going to have an easier time accessing the remote learning. Anyways, I just wanted to put that out there as a potentially like an option where we put more effort into getting the elementary kids back in earlier. Miss um, uh, Stancer, did you have a question? Uh, I have just a quick question for Miss Spitzer. Did that announcement include off-campus students or was that just on-campus students? I'd have to, I, I don't think they'd have control over the off-campus students, but I, I'd have to digest the, I didn't That's see okay. more That's than one. Okay. Yep. So I think what I'd um, just sort of react into both Mr. Harrington's question, which um, I agree, like there's, there's we, we, you know, understanding sort of that, that trajectory is really important, particularly in light of this, this new news, because I, I think getting these metrics is the most important puzzle piece for us as sort of defining that and sort of defining what we're comfortable with in terms of um, community spread and infection rate in, in, in terms of getting our getting students into school. Like to me, that is that is the most critical piece for us. Like where where um, 
schools have reopened in other countries and they've had the outbreaks, it's it's because they hadn't had clear metrics and they didn't stick to them um, for for their protocols in in schools and. Um, and so I do think sort of out, outlining that, and as several of you have said, you know, being clear and transparent about what are the data sources that we're using, how are we calculating them, what are sort of the change over time, and and not that that's carved in stone, like new information might be new information, and we might, you know, decide that we, we you know, in, in, a, in, a, in this kind of situation, we can't be coming back every single week to sort of hash through and discuss whether we're comfortable with, with X or Y or, or Z um, in terms of our schools, because with every new piece of information, people's fears and anxieties are going to be changing. And, and, and it's on, the, 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 having the metrics is really the guiding force for us to sort of be able to evaluate where we are and whether whether we're in a situation where we you know we feel comfortable put it, enabling students to be in in the schools um, at that particular time, so I I do I, I would love to keep coming back to it. I don't think anybody one of us is is a public health scientist that's capable of saying this is the right metric. So I, I think like continuing the conversation and having um, reaching out to. Um, area experts to help guide us and provide um, provide that input for us to to be able to make those decisions. Um, it'd be great if the state was helping us on that as well. Um, so I, I think that's um, for me the most important piece of that. And I would echo um, the sentiment, actually, that a couple of people have said that a it feels ten months feels like a very very long time for any of our students to not have any in person connection with with their um, with their teachers and each other, um, and at the same time, um, you know, figuring out ways that we can sort of I like the idea of that model five that we sort of um, jigger the 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 elementary students also to be to have some of that sort of um, whether if we're not in model one for elementary. Um, the other models, having those older elementary schools not coming in until November, like how do we, how can we sort of bring them, um, enable them to have that connection with their school and their teachers um, before then would be great. Um, I see Ms. Kenny's hand up. Um, so I have just another question about the, um, the matrix. So that information comes out weekly. Right, I think that's what I was understanding. So if it comes out weekly, so say this week we're good, but next week the numbers, they don't work. So we scale back to all remote learning, right? So then at what point do you, how long does that phase last? So when do you switch back? And would that, could that like end up being a, well, this week we're in school and next week, we're at home and the week after that we're back to school like how how long will each one of those transitions i guess last mr denley yeah um i don't have the answer but um this has like a direct application to some other data analysis problems in stock trading so basically what mr menino and Ms. kenny are talking about is the whipsaw problem where you have where you have a system that's going along and you have a trigger point, right? So on this point, it's the 75 confirmed cases or the test positivity rate. So what happens when you get into a case where your test positivity rate is 5.1, 4.9, 5.1, 4.9? Do you send kids back every day or every week or every month? So what you do is you establish um, with, with the, the person that's running the system what's appropriate for that system um, in, in, in order to maintain the health of the system. So in stocks, it's obviously a much different discussion. So uh, for our purposes, we would talk to the educators. So this is something that, you know, so just, just me talking, I would expect the superintendent and the principals uh, to, to think about, take this feedback and say, okay, imagine you have the most volatile situation where this is going up and down and up and down. How frequently do we want to be phasing kids in and out and teachers in and out? What, what makes the most sense, right? Is, is it weekly that that I mean, to us, maybe that sounds a little too frequent, uh, but, you know, we should talk to the educators. Maybe it's monthly, maybe it's quarterly. Um, and then and then you recommend that. And so and so even if you do phase phase back to fully online uh, and the next week, the positivity rate drops, you don't do anything 
until you reach that that you know that minimum period that you're back. So that, that that's one way to solve that kind of a, a problem in the in this kind of a the whipsaw problem. It's a really good point, though. Dr. Morris. So. Uh... So I don't disagree theoretically with Mr. Dumling. I think, you know, the reality, and this is in some of the documents that Desi came out, is that at any moment we may have to move remote uh, because of something that happens in the school. I want to be really clear about that. I'm not trying to not answer your question, but I think then for me, the data is based, you know, one data points seven days, one data points an average over 14 days. So it's sort of baking in the cake um, that we're getting averages. And I think to Mr. Harrington's point, especially if it's based on an increase, we may want to be more conservative about returning and more quick to, to move to remote than the, the other way around. Um, but I wanted to answer some other questions um, or other comments, respond to some other comments. So Franklin County right now is 14 per 100,000 and Hampshire County is 30 cases per 100,000 in the last seven days. Um, so um, that's just wanted to be clear on the that a request Ms. Hall had. It really was at the touch of the fingers. I just didn't have the screen open um, for that. I think, you know, my own personal viewpoint um, is if the committees want to start in um, remote in distance learning, um, that I would ask for a more extended period than um, a month. I think if we're going to, if we're going to do it, we got to commit to it. And, and I think uh, my personal opinion is uh, that commitment should be longer than you know a month uh, or something like that, where people are just getting their you know um, getting in the flow of it, given the training that we're doing. It's also the case that I think I want to acknowledge the public comments and some of the feedback we've heard. Uh, I think much of that is based on concerns that uh, not about Massachusetts data. There was references to some of that, but not that Massachusetts can be the new Florida or Arizona or Texas, um, but that the situation that we're in right now, until there's a vaccine some hope uh, would be would be different. And so, you know, I think if, if the committees want to make a decision, you know, based on that, I would ask for actually an extended, more extended period uh, of distance learning. Um, I'm not suggesting or recommending this, but I think if that's where the committees are, uh, I would advocate not to have a short period like that, um, but really a much more lengthy period. I might think a little differently, but also when I think about families who need to make plans, uh, particularly some of our most vulnerable families, like leaving them uncertain doesn't make me, I mean, feel comfortable. And if we're thinking about some of our intensive needs kids and how we're going to meet those kids, kids needs, uh, I don't have a plan. I know we've been working on a, a backup one in case this went this way. We can't organize a plan for a month for those kids that's effective. You know, we'd have to commit to them for a longer period. So I think if that's where the committees land, uh, I guess my request, and I can go into more detail, perhaps if this is a conversation, I, you know, I don't know what the right time is, probably no one does tonight, uh, but since that was directly referenced, uh, if that's where the committees are, uh, I'll talk about some implications and we can do that more naturally, but I would not be in favor of a relatively brief delay in the school year. Uh, I'd be much more in favor of, of a lengthier, um, lengthier uh, distance learning experience. Um, so that our staff can do it. I think the uncertainty um, is really hard on planning. It's also really hard on families and kids um, to not know. Families are looking at options and they're going to make decisions. Uh, we need to support them in that. And so um, I guess I, I guess I would I think a longer period of clarity uh, would be better for our staff and our families. Um, that's just my personal opinion, but um, I did want to respond to it. And again, I don't know if this was appropriate moment for it, but since it was it was raised on the table, I thought I'd, I'd share my opinion. I don't think the comfort piece, and I'm not suggesting that's why um, Ms. Seeger made her comment, but but I don't think that's gonna get you know significantly changed. And I think Ms. Spitzer's point about the potential as we head towards cold and flu season, I think there's some evidence that things will get more challenging um, later. So I don't know, that's just my, my initial thoughts. I think if, if we wanna have that larger conversation, or whenever we want to have it, I can speak more definitively to some of my thoughts about it. But um, I think if we want to go down that road, you know, um, I'd want a much longer period and, and, and want to really talk about what metrics we'd use um, on that topic. Okay. I, I got a little lost, sorry, I'm confused on, on, are you saying, when you say short and short versus long, I, I'm not sure what you were referencing. So what I thought I heard was a period, maybe a relatively brief, relatively brief period of time before phase one would start. 
um, that would be after mid-September. So I heard that. And Ms. Ms. Seeger, if I heard that wrong, I apologize. Um, that's what I thought I heard. Meaning starting with distance learning in mid-September? Is that? Right. So I'll let Ms. If it's okay with you, I might have misinterpreted Ms. Seeger's comments, and I apologize if I did. I, I think, is it okay if I speak? Yeah. I think what I was referring to when I look at these models was um, interpreting them as having potential start dates based on the half months. And maybe that's not the case. And it's more of just the pattern set in them. And like the, what's more important in these models is the distance between the groups coming in versus the actual start dates. And it could have just been a misinterpretation on my part. So. No, I think I misinterpreted your comment. So I apologize. I think, you know, um, I think it would be both the start dates would be based on the public health metrics being in place, both for phase one in terms of the core ones of anyone being in the school, uh, and then the the more stringent ones uh, for phases two and three uh, to start. So I apologize. I, I thought I heard something different, Ms. Seeger. My apologies. So uh, just a clarification, just like a hypothetical clarification question. So staying on that, if 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 we vote that this first day of school is the 16th, to determine whether phase one actually is in is in person, whatever phase one, you'd be looking the 16th is a Wednesday, I believe. When so you'd be looking at the prior Wednesday's data to make that determination. Exactly. And sorry, it was a rabbit hole that uh, we didn't need to go down because I misinterpreted a comment. So I apologize, Ms. Seeger. What other um, comments? I'm, I'm going to look at um, folks that haven't spoken up yet to see if you had any um, comments. So um, Ms. Lord, Ms. Barlow, Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Harrington. Mr. Menino. Ms. Barla? Yes, forgive me because I might not have gotten this right because I'm still trying to catch up. Um, I guess it's hard for me to look at all of this information and think a lot about the metrics for the phases without thinking about what happens and, and defining more clear outcomes and metrics if a positive case happens in one of our schools. And so I know this isn't maybe the right part of the agenda, but it's hard for me to, to separate those two things because in the documents, it looks like more than one case. And it looks like certain if there's one case or potentially one case, you have 14 or 18 students going home for two weeks and then they're coming back. So it's kind of back to Ms. Kenny's point to like, how much are we going to flip flop back and forth and when are we going to make a call so that the teachers can focus on providing education to our students? So I'm trying to think of what the, what, I'm sorry, not to be flip. I'm just trying to see the, is it a comment or is there something you want me to respond to? Oh, I guess, I guess maybe a little more clarification on, you know, if something happens in the school, like, I guess, I guess a clearer um, metric for when we would, maybe flip to online education in the event that there's an outbreak in one of our schools. Gotcha. So when you say outbreak, I think of, uh, we're certainly shutting down school if, we've, if we know that there's an outbreak. Um, the guidance that we got from Desi and from the state kind of, uh, to your point, I think, describes what could happen if there is a positive case. You know, it talks about whether an individual is symptomatic, uh, exposed to a positive one, um, and, and some of this depends on whether they're, you know, what's a close contact. Are they under six feet for longer than 15 minutes? Um, and um, so I think that's where their information gets on. And they do want us to contact them and the public health authorities, uh, which we would do for that. Um, so, you know, I think the, the language that maybe is the most important in there is when there's a suspected in-school transmission, superintendent consult the local board of health as proposed next steps. These steps may include making a decision to close part of the school for a short time, one to three days, close the school partially or fully for the longer duration of a 14 day quarantine period. And this, I think this goes back to the three feet through six feet thing that, you know, what's a close contact is closer than six feet for more than 15 minutes. Um, and so I think that's why we do, you know, have our contract tracing folks 
uh, who can who can go into that. I think in reality, this is not in the DESE guidance. This is just my one person's opinion. Uh, if we do have a positive case, even if the guidance is that instruction can continue, I think logically families and staff members are going to want to get themselves tested and do that, um, and and that students won't come to school for a couple of days, even if the public health guidance is is not as conservative. I think the real guidance is, I think that's just the way it's going to play out, right? I think that that classroom uh, will close, and then we have to do the contract tracing around siblings and other other measures around that. So, you know, I'm not trying to dismiss the public health guidance. I also just think public guide, health guidance gives us what public health experts would recommend and what we know human behavior is, is gonna be more conservative than that. Um, at least that's what we've seen so far on this front. So does that help a little bit with that question? Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry it took me a second to, to get it. Um, Ms. Spitzer and then Mr. Demling. So I guess just to continue on um, two thoughts. Um, it seems like we should definitely have some fixed metrics, but maybe creating like a dashboard of the metrics that we're looking at. So it would be maybe these are the hard and fast ones that we're saying, you know, we cross this line, this is a red line, we cross it, we close down schools. However, I think there are other things that we'd want to look at, like how, what's the, what's the testing availability in the community? Can we get tests if we need them? How long is it taking to get those tests back? Those are things that have fluctuated quite a bit over the course of this pandemic and actually really matter a lot in our ability to keep students and teachers in school if we do start to see an uptick. And then the other thing I was thinking is the absent rate. You know, So if we're seeing like a lot of kids who are out sick in a, in a time period or teachers as well, like maybe that would be something that we'd wanna be looking at every week. So I'm not, I don't want to be didactic about what those metrics should be, but I think it might be really useful if we created, and I'm, I know you're doing this kind of on an ad hoc basis, but maybe creating a superintendent's update where you bring out a spreadsheet with all of the numbers that you're looking at and the trends in them and, and what just so um, if we, if the school committee is going to be brought into making this decision about the opening and closing, closing, it would be good to have numbers that we're looking at over time consistently. And, and know the sources that they're coming from and, and how we're weighing them. I might add, it's, I, I don't disagree that those are all helpful. I'm not sure we or the district are the right people to be defining what those metrics should be in the sense that like we have public health officials, we have public health, um, a public health department. I, I, I feel like we're asking our district to step into a role that you know rather than than us than our district sort of taking on this task of tracking all of these metrics is there is there an opportunity to lean on actually people whose job it is to, to be doing that um rather than asking dr morris and the district to be doing that it, i feel like some of these things may be beyond beyond what we have the capacity and competency to be able to to decide so um mr Dunling. yeah i mean i guess i agree with both of you like on the one hand i i, I don't think that school committee members should drop everything we're doing and like ramp up and become professional epidemiologists on the other hand you know this draft metrics table is is to me the most critical piece to the plan because it is the pivot point between um, fully remote learning and, uh, and and the degree to which students are on site. And it's, you know, frankly, it's the piece that's missing from every district plan that's gone fully remote. It's when are they coming back? You know, it's, it, that's completely left unsaid, right? And it's, it's, it's completely left unsaid in a lot of the district plans across the country that say, you know, we're, we're back in school, but well, when are you, when you, anyway. Um, so, so I, I feel like, um, I feel like from a school committee point of view, and I do understand that, uh, and we're always bumping up against this problem, right, because of the nature of our committee in the district, is that there's always this kind of gray area, right, between the school committee's role of oversight and, and the district's role of, of uh, operational um, uh, uh, accountability and, and administration, and, and, and where do those lines meet and to what detail do, do we actually need to vote and, and on that? And I get that, but, but I, do, I do feel like um, for me to be comfortable voting uh, the phasing plan tonight, I, I, I want to be able to say I, I support these metrics as presented and I reserve the right for the school committee to discuss it in the future and recommend stronger metrics if, if we feel that that's appropriate. You know, and I don't, 
I don't I don't feel it's it's overstepping our bounds if if we come back and we say we strongly recommend that you know that you add X Y Z metric. I I feel like the superintendent could take that uh, under advisement and say that okay, well based on the medical experts I've talked with, I don't think that's appropriate. And then we could have that discussion, but that's part of the discussion, right? Like, I don't think that, um, I don't think that input from a school committee point of view should be shut down. This is, this is my point of view. Um, and I feel like um, because this process is moving so fast as, as we knew it would from, from the start of this two months ago, um, that, that to have such a critical piece, you know, that we're like, you, we are signing off on, um, I, I feel like, um, you know, for me, I feel like it needs to be at least as strong as presented and then to, to have the to have the opportunity to really digest this and and to get to all the comments that, that I've written down, but I haven't had a chance to, you know, uh, uh, really um, um, think through um, uh, so that, you know, next week or the week after, if, if this needs to evolve to a different place, it, it can't it can't get stronger. Um, just just process wise, I just wanted to note that that we're hitting nine o'clock. And, and we're also hitting August 6th. And so from a, a committee point of view, I, I'm just feeling like our responsibility is that we need to make a decision on phasing like tonight and soon, um, just as our responsibility for the district. And I'll just share that my, from my point of view, I have a personal preference, but I feel like it's more important for me to support the consensus committee view. Um, I heard Ms. Spitzer talk about a possible model five. I guess I'd like to hear what that is. Um, uh, I, I feel like some variant of, of model two is, 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 is where we ought to land up. I, I, like, I like the model four. I like the improvements it, it, it made, but if, if there are others uh, that, that have a, a clear idea of what that is, um, I guess I'd also like to hear, uh, you know, short, shortly and clearly and frankly, what Dr. Morris's recommendation is. Um, uh, as you know, as, as a factor in our decision. Thank you. Actually, I was, that was one of the things that was on my list was to go back and say, we, you know, we're looking at this and we're looking at the data from the parents perspective, or families and students and staff perspective. What is, you know, from an administration perspective that you, you referenced before sort of the ease of bringing students in or transitioning at quarter breaks or specific time breaks. So, from from your perspective, Dr. Morris, what what would be your preference? So I think if we're going to have um, if we're going to do one of the model, I don't know what phasing model five is, so I can't comment on that one. <laughs> it seems like you know the mystery one. Uh, but you know, from my perspective and our perspective, out of the four that are there, um, phasing model four would be the preference for a lot of the reasons that you heard from me and, and from Mr. Sadiq earlier. Um, just it seems like it makes sense. Logistically, it makes sense. I know it holds out um, secondary kids a little longer than some people uh, might want, but I think I think just it, if we focus on a small group at the beginning, uh, and particularly the groups that have the least access to distance learning, I think that's in our best interest. Um, and I think you know, I, I know some people think it's too aggressive, some people think it's conservative, but, you know, for our perspective, I think that's where, if we land there, that seems like um, the best approach from my personal perspective. But again, I don't know what other models, not, I'm not, I'm not be trying to be flip with Ms. Spitzer, but it may be that you look at this data and say, what about this? And, and you know, certainly um, I'm, I'm open to other thoughts on the matter as well. Um, Ms. Seeger, I, I saw your hand up. I, I was just wondering if you could help me understand something because I'm not sure I'm fully getting this. Um, if phase one has certain metrics and we went with any of these models, but let's say we went with model four. Um, I guess what I'm what I'm not understanding and maybe you were talking a little bit about this is would we be in phase one right away? Or would we be pre phase one with some remote time? in there for those, those phase, that phase one group. So that that's what I'm not clear on in all of this is I, clearly by the metrics now, yes, we could be in phase one. Would that start the first day of school? Um, or would you prefer and the administration and staff prefer like a time in there to get get their remote stuff under their belts and, and things settled out a little bit and then enter phase one? Is, is there a, this, this is what I think I'm kind of missing in all of this is um, 
with a time between the phases and what in, in the initial start. Dr. Morris. Yeah, so my perspective is that the students in phase one are the students who are most in need of the commodity that is in person learning. Um, that's a group that has not had in-person learning for months and months and months. Uh, we don't know what the future will hold. If our data is good at that point, I would want to maximize their uh, ability to have in-person learning. So I would feel like that. Uh, I think if we didn't have 10 days before the school year, I might have felt a little differently. Um, I frankly, you know, did have feel a little bit differently about that. I think with, you know, actually 11 staff days before the school year starts, um, I feel like, you know, if, if we're going to start with kids in person, I think that's the group that is every day they're in person, even if it's a phase, like I know some of the staff have recommended, could we, you know, almost phase it in with not full days, but partial days to start the year. I think that makes a whole lot of sense um, for certain populations. But um, that's my, my perspective is that it would, it would start at the beginning of the school year, um, that every day those students are in school um, is a real benefit. Um, and that's not a critique of the students. It's just that's the nature of being a very young kid and not being able to read or not having, uh, you know, the linguistic skills and some of the challenges that come with that, um, or having intensive special needs and the challenges about accommodations modifications occurring uh, in a virtual environment. So that's my my perspective. Um, and I think one of the things in, in, um, that came up actually in some of the preschool conversation in the Amherst School Committee um, that they had earlier is what we'd want to also do for that po those populations is train them that if we do train students, so if we do go to virtual, that we're building their skill set to be more effective. We couldn't do that in the spring. There was no time. It wasn't like on March 13th, we could say, hey, let's stop what we're doing midday. We got this announcement and let's do some ongoing work with students so that they're better equipped to access distance learning in case we need to go there. Um, so that we would really want to build that into the program so that we're building the capacity of all students, but particularly some of our most vulnerable students, uh, to be more successful in case we get there in the future. So, you know, some of that would have to be actually be some of the initial work. And it sounds kind of strange to be training students uh, and working and developing their skills for distance learning. But I think that actually was a missing link for many, many students who um, distance learning didn't come naturally. And we were trying to help acclimate students to a distance environment from a distance environment. And if that distance environment was in and of itself the barrier, it, it really led to some challenge. It, it has led to some challenges and will continue to. So um, that's just my personal perspective on it. I, I don't speak for anybody else on it. Ms. Spitzer, you had your hand up. I guess that kind of goes back to seeing that my model five keeps getting brought up. Um, I, I'll be more specific. So the, 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 the question I had was trying to figure out these um, the date. So I'm assuming September 16th or the 18th is the first day back for all of the priority groups in across all four models. That was my understanding. But then we don't actually have any dates or any sense of how long these gaps are between the phases. And so I think my concern actually piggybacks really well on what you were saying is that for, you know, the second and third graders, and even, you know, I don't know as well fourth and sixth graders, but I feel like for, for elementary kids, there is, a, it's harder to go remote. Um, and so there is a strong benefit for even if it's just um, bringing them into an environment where they can be in a tent and meet their teacher in person and maybe get some orientation to their Chromebook and how this new, um, you know, app, or, like, can we build into this model a way that the, especially our younger kids, even if it's an outdoor kind of half a day, even if it's not a full five days a week model, can we get them in? So they start building that community, building the facility with the tools, because my big concern with the model that has, it's not that um, it, with the kids starting, elementary kids starting in November, is that it, it just seems to me like a really big um, delay in building those skill sets. And maybe that is another doc. I didn't really see that in the opening, you know, like I haven't seen a convers uh, any details about how we might be doing a little bit of outdoor in person or some sort of half day kind of phase in for those kids who are gonna be starting so late. So I'm not gonna be, um, I'd be happy to vote for the last model if we could also in the future try to build in some of those um, ways of connecting with students 
in person that might be different from actually being in the classroom for a full day, five days a week? Yeah, I think um, Charlotte, North Carolina, which is starting all virtual, um, and I fully support that. I mean, their numbers would be well above any of these metrics, or at least it was when I last looked. Um, they built in something along the lines of what you're saying for elementary students, uh, where there was some outdoor in-person uh, kind of orientation. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's something, I think it makes sense. I struggle if we're outside, the, it brings around some logistical challenges, you know, in terms of like Wi-Fi doesn't really extend that far outside our building. So I'd have to think through some parts like that. I think the other thing is so much of the initial work will be on distancing, wearing masks and all that for elementary kids that um, I, I have to think, I'm just being really transparent here. I'd have to think through how much, content would they get because so much of the work would really be around continuing an orientation to being you know physically safe and in this environment so let me do some thinking about that i'm not opposed in principle i just i see some logistical challenges that i'm not saying they're not over uh, they can't be overcome but i just i want to think it through a little bit it, sort of building on that maybe another another way of thinking about that is for for the students that will be starting all remote um, in any of these scenarios at some point they obviously have to come into the building to pick up their materials right to pick up their devices and and that is there is there any in any of these is there any sort of initial sort of orientation when they do or is it literally a tactical transactional exchange of, of handing the material or is there opportunity to have at least some sort of you know, face-to-face -face time, small groups or one-on-one -on -one, um, in, in that, which might not be like that it's a in-person learning opportunity, but it's a, it's a check-in and a um, sort of relationship building opportunity as opposed to a learning um, instructional opportunity for those. So we haven't gotten into detail thinking about that, but this is great feedback that we can, you know, bring back to the team and continue to think about and, and try to work with. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, how are, uh, I've heard a couple people mention that they're, that they're feeling that they, they could vote, uh, tonight pending certain information. Um, does, is that how majority of people are feeling at this point or, um, seeing some thumbs up? Ms. Hall. Yeah, I would just say I I feel like I could vote on the on the phasing tonight. Or I mean, I think the discussion has been really good and really helpful, and that there's certainly more conversation to be had around this and some work to be done. But I would feel comfortable doing that tonight. Mr. Demling, I just you know, Dr. Moore. So before I vote on like so I'm comfortable voting model four and unless someone voices like a strong opinion for a different model that I'm, I'm open to hearing that um but Dr. Morris I just I guess I just want to just ask the question plainly and clearly that are you open to the committee coming back and expressing uh having a discussion and potentially recommending potentially stronger metrics for for phasing yeah I, I really make sure that, that question is is clearly put out there yeah. Um, and so, yes, is the quick answer. You know, I wouldn't expect you to endorse something as complex as phasing in the first time you looked at it. Um, and I think there's more conversation to be had on that. Um, so definitively, yes. Mr. Harrington. Okay, just sort of a procedural question. Would we be voting on each individual model or is there kind of a consensus that the uh, preferred number four would be the one that we would vote on right now or well so i think it, it depends on the I, I was asking myself the, the question but i think it also depends on the motion that um that any committee member would like to make for their committee um miss seeker I still have one more question on the models. Um, and maybe this will get ironed out and you can tell me if that's going to be the case. 
but it's the distance between bringing in the different groups of the phasing. Um, say we started in phase one right away. Um, how long until phase two? And I know there's metrics in there, right? But is there any sort of time too? Because you could say a week later, well, let's start phase two. And then a week later, well, let's start phase three. Um, I'm not suggesting you said that at all. I'm just wondering sort of how, how the process might go. Yeah, so um, I think I can be more clear that it would be no sooner than, you know, for, for instance, and, and model four, since that's the one that people are talking about, um, it would be after Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, it so, I mean, a different way to say it, and I think to your point, maybe a more accurate way to say it would be no sooner than before Indigenous Peoples Day, because it's that's the date, but it, the metrics have to go along with it. And for the November date, you know, I was loosely considering, you know, after Veterans Day, but I think um, a better way to say it would be no sooner than Veterans Day, because um, I think that clarifies, and thank you for being, I didn't pick it up sooner, but I think it's a really good point that it's it's no sooner than and only if the metrics allow for. Um, is that a helpful clarifier? Ms. Eager? That definitely helps me a lot. It makes me feel better and like I, I can vote. So thank you. Um, okay. Um, would, uh, would anybody from the region like to make a motion? Mr. Demling. I move that the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee adopt the model for phasing schedule. Moved by Demling. I'll second that, seconded by McDonald. Is there any further discussion from the region? Ms. Spitzer. Uh, procedural question, should we state that it would be contingent on met, you know, data, sorry, I'm having trouble thinking, but contingent on meeting certain metrics as set by this committee or Mr. Demling? Uh, I'll take it as a friendly amendment that it is contingent on meeting the metrics as presented, which may be made stronger by guidance of this committee in the future. If, if such phrasing is amenable to, uh, to Ms. Spencer. That's good, thank you. And I'll second that again. Okay, we'll move to a roll call vote. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Um, McDonald, aye. Mr. Sullivan, are you here? Not present. The motion passes um, eight to zero and one not present. Uh, I'll, I'll make the similar motion for the Amherst School P Committee. I move that the Amherst School Committee adopt phasing model four with contingent upon metrics as defined and um, a, and reviewed and revised by as by committee. Is that the amendment that we made? Yeah, as as. Mr. Demling. As, um, as presented and as um, possibly adjusted by the committee, committee's guidance in the future. So something to that effect. <laughs> I'm not sure something to that effect is official motion language, but. <laughs> I move that we accept uh, that we vote to approve model four um, contingent on the metrics as presented and as may be potentially revised um, um, uh, by the by the committee. 
Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Spitzer. Roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Hey, Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. It passes Amherst five to zero. Ms. Hall? All right, I, since I wrote that down, I will move for the Pelham School Committee that we adopt the model four phasing schedule contingent upon meeting the metrics as presented and as may be revised in the future by the committee. Is there a second? Second. second. Great, moved by Hall, seconded by Menino. Uh, roll call vote, Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. And Ms. Barlow. Barlow, aye. And Hall, aye. Passes unanimously five to zero. Um, we are now uh, almost three hours into our meeting. I believe uh, we need to actually move to extend our meeting. Um, and I might also suggest that we take a five minute break. Um, so I move that we uh, extend our meeting by 30 minutes. Second. Moved by McDonald, second by Harrington. Um, do we need to take, I presume we need to take a vote. Oh, boy, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And are we uh, okay to take a five minute break? Okay. It is 9.19, so we will return at 9.25. So I'm, I'm gaveling us back in. Oh no, Ben. We were <laughs> um, great. Okay. So next on our agenda item, I have to scroll back, is um, the vote on the back to school plan. Um, Dr. Morris, would you like to, I think the full plan is in our packet. Yep. Um, so it's a long document. I'm not going to try to describe all of it. Um, but um, I think what it focuses on is, is really um, all the collective work and the guidance that I've received from, from votes from the school committees over the last couple months about uh, priorities that the school committee has um, and working with our, um, with our providers, our, our public health department, and again, focusing on and prioritizing learning at the beginning of our students who have the least access to, to distance learning while still building a remote Model. I mean, I think it's worth noting that the model that you uh, you all that just got voted in means that students, mo the vast majority of students in grades two to twelve, will start in a virtual environment. Uh, there'd be very few students in, and that the vast majority of students at the secondary level wouldn't wouldn't return, and staff wouldn't return until November. Um, and so it's trying to be very deliberate uh, about starting very small uh, with the students who have the greatest need for. Um, for being for in-person education and if the metrics allow then we gradually increase that uh, i think the one thing that i want to be really clear about in the document is that uh, we're still unclear about the capacity to do whether it's a hybrid model or uh, more of the typical elementary model we've been talking about for the upper elementary grades and that's because until we know which students are going to come back and how our staffing models go uh, that's just one thing that even though this is a plan that's supposed to be submitted to, that will be well depending if you vote or not, uh, was intended to be submitted to DASI. That's one uh, open question that until we get more data, uh, we can't uh, make a determination on uh, our capacity to pull off um, upper grade education, whether that be a hybrid model, uh, whether it be in two days a week uh, or uh, more than that. Um, but I wanted to highlight that one because that's one that we've talked about a couple times and we're just not at a decision point because we don't have enough information to be definitive. Uh, and we'd rather be intentionally uh, transparently unclear than to try to be clear in a way that then we have to go back on that decision later. 
Um, but really, there's no surprises in the document. Hopefully, you felt like there was no surprise in the document. I know it was a really long document. It's, it's a compilation of all the things we've been talking about. Uh, I want to be really clear that, you know, I know you just voted a, a phasing piece, and um, I'll, I know some people didn't hear this earlier because they weren't on the call, is that if there are adjustments that you all feel like need to be made to this, then that, that's fine. And really, it's just trying to see if this document defines and describes where the committee wants to be in terms of moving forward. Um, and if it doesn't, then we'll make adjustments to the document and move forward along with it. Uh, but it was trying to capture in an ever evolving situation, uh, the feedback that we received from the committee and how to actualize that in a plan to move forward. Um, that was both conservative from a public health point of view, um, I think very deliberate in a public health point of view. I, I recognize there's different opinions about that, um, and I want to acknowledge them. I, you know, again, I go back to what people might not have heard earlier is that I know everyone on the committee, as well as myself, uh, reads every public comment that comes in and, and considers it and considers also in less formal conversations as well. Um, so I guess the question for the committee uh, is, this, does, this describe, does this document describe where the committee is now? And if it, if it does, then great. And if it doesn't, then we should talk about that and, and what adjustments you'd like to see. And, and, and I made a misnomer there, I should say committees, um, because you know I, 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 we meet in this joint way because I think it's worked well. So I really want to thank Ms. Hall and Ms. McDonald for uh, organizing this and Ms. Dancer and Mr. Demling as well as being the vice chairs of those committees. Um, but each committee is able to make an autonomous decision. We wrote it as one because uh, we've been meeting that way. Um, but I, I also just want to uh, acknowledge the autonomy of each committee to have a discussion and, um, and have its own feelings on this matter as well. So I think I'm happy to answer any questions, but again, uh, you know, I'd be curious, but I think reading it, hopefully you felt like, oh, I've seen this before. Oh, I've seen this before. This was from this slide, right? There was the advantage of meeting every week for many, many, or just about every week for many, many weeks and, and more than a month on this is that really is a cumulative process. And um, so hopefully you felt like there was nothing in there that uh, seemed like it was coming out of left field because it was, it was all things that we talked about before. And I think that's all I'd like to queue up for it. And I'm happy to answer any questions anyone, any committee members would have. Mr. Demling. So I find this one is one of those funny examples where we meet on something for a really long time, have all these in-depth discussions about the various aspects of it. And then we get to the, the decision point and then we're like, oh, and we have this massive document. Like, oh, okay, like, <laughs> um, like, like when we did the uh, the dual language vote, right? I remember that that final discussion was very short, even though it was a momentous vote. Anyway, as to your core question of, um, does this reflect where where we're currently at? Uh, I, just just speaking for myself, um, yeah, more or less, it 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 does. Um, I I didn't find any surprises as I mostly as 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 I read through it. Um, I think, you know, getting back to something uh, Ms. Lord said at the very beginning, um, you know, there's obviously a couple, you know, major variables still to be determined um, that, that, you know, could alter um, the the, the uh, environment that this, this is implemented in. Um, and we would have to adjust to that. Obviously, the, the COVID data and, and our staffing resources that, that's to be determined through co collective bargaining. But those are processes that are, are, are playing out. Um, you know, so I, I guess, you know, so one thing that, that did stick out to me, you know, if, if we're going to like, you know, uh, look at it at a detailed level is is the this idea about outdoor learning. You know, this, this, keep, this keeps coming up. And, um, you know, if, if, if I were to synergize the, the too many articles I've read over the last two months about um, the science of COVID, you know, one one of these consensus um, things that seems to be emerging is, is this de-emphasis of, of um, contact trans surface transmission and and the increased emphasis of aerosolized transmission and i always say that we shouldn't play armchair epidemiologist but here i am um and so anyway it, it it all the 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 cumulative evidence it just it just adds more um uh, urgency to be transitioning uh our education our learning to outdoors when feasible uh, in addition to all the awesome well-being benefits of it, right, for play and, and whatnot that, you know, we, we, I'm sure we all feel. So, you know, I, I scanned the entire document and I found to the extent possible classes will be permitted to meet outdoors. Meeting outdoors increases the ability for students to physically distance. And when feasible, students will eat outdoors. That, that's pretty much it. And it's not that I don't believe the district or teachers are 
are on the same page in terms of the spirit of trying to get it outdoors. I just, I would, in a, this large of a document where, where, this, where this really wants to be a core principle, I, I wasn't, I expected it to be a little more in the main line theme structure of how things are going to go. And maybe, maybe that's more in the curriculum aspect. Maybe that's, that, that will come out more in the detailed public forums, but I don't know if you could just sort of comment on that. Are, are there major aspects that are, aren't just appropriate for this document you're thinking about or that administration's thinking about that I'm, that I'm missing? Or, um, or, or, or are you still trying to push the envelope about trying to get people outside as much as possible? Yeah, no, I think that's a valid critique. I know Ms. Chamberlain's on this call. She's someone who, uh, uh, not that others don't, but she just maybe, uh, you know, sends me more interesting emails uh, on that particular topic. Um, and so I do think there's some resources that we are looking at, and I think some like the Hitchcock Center, I know Ms. Chamberlain sent me a link of some of their work. So I think it's a valid critique that it's not articulated more clearly um, in this document, but I think in general as a principle, you're right that it, it remains our principle. And I think starting with the populations we start with, that's another advantage of the phasing is just when there's fewer students present, it, it allows for more outdoor learning, not just under a tent, but just in the same way that our gardening program. We never had a tent and all of a sudden we have a gardening program at our elementary schools that consistently is a high quality outdoor education. So um, I think you know that's something else. I mentioned ELL is gonna be added and I think we can be a little more explicit about that in the document. Um, but I think you're right that there's, there's, it's not an intentional omission. I think it's just trying to compile a lot of information but we should be more explicit about that. So thank you. Mr. Harrington. I kind of took out a couple little elements and put them in a little side document here, but um, so one area that I have, well, there's two kind of areas I have a little concern. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see a tad bit more clarity is, uh, so under the transportation section, there, there's a part uh, about bus monitors. The district will make every reasonable effort to provide bus monitors. Um, are they going to be somewhat of a requirement on the bus? And I, I asked this because of the second part of, of uh, that I needed some clarity on here. I, I kind of don't feel comfortable putting a lone driver kind of in, in charge of certain things like a, there's a part, if a child presents symptoms, presents with symptoms, the, the child will not be permitted to board the bus. It, is there an expectation that it will be the driver that deems that that student won't get on the bus or i mean i i would just like to see a little bit more mm -hmm. detail regarding that because after talking to a lot of drivers that that's a key sticking point that i i i, know I won't speak for them but it it seems as there aren't a lot of drivers who are willing to be the lone person to make that call mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's super valid, and and I think that's um, some feedback we can take in and make some edits there. Uh, and I think from your comment, I don't want it's not suggesting you speak for the committee, but it sounds like you, you know you'd really like it to be more clear that there will be a bus monitor not recommended. Um, you know, and that's something that we've had conversations about, and, and really that's why we're having pushing on the conversation tonight because I think if if the committee is going to vote a plan that does involve in-person education, then, then then we get to work. It was really hard to do recruitment of who might do that, right? Like this is the first step in a sequence of, okay, who's coming back? Who's in phase one? We might not ask phase three students yet if they're coming back, because that's that might be in November. And why would we ask them in August if they're coming in November, right? Their minds are probably going to change multiple times. But once we know which kids are student, what students are coming back, then we got to, you know, figure out, okay, what are the bus routes and what are the monitors and how many do we need? So I think you know that's a cut change I'm very comfortable making, and I know some of our administrators have raised that same piece. So um, that's a friendly amendment, as to use your all language. I would, I would um, second that, and um, thank you, Mr. Hangton, for bringing that up because I, actually, in fact, it's been something on my mind ever since my kids were in second grade um, that there's only one adult on the bus, and um, I can't tell you how many times I've sat behind a bus that pulled over because they had to wait for students to to settle down, right? And um, and so particularly in this environment, I do think that that should be stated very clearly that we will have bus monitors um, so that our bus drivers can really focus on getting the, our students to school safely. 
Um, I, oh, Mr. Sullivan, and I think Ms. Ken, Ms. Kenny, did you have your hand up also? No, okay, Mr. Sullivan. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan. All right, I'm gonna, my, am I speaking now? Cause I, my microphone wasn't working earlier. All right, so the, my first qu my bus stuff, um, the first one is I was talking to a bus driver today who reminded me that the Federal Motor Carriers Association does not allow hand sanitizer on their buses. So they can't, you can't put a hand sanitizer dispenser on the, the steps of the bus to have kids use it on the way in and out because it can't be on the bus. And my other question was, if we are sending arms and ARHS priority groups in September, does that kick in the entire bus system? Because if we do, don't we have to provide transportation if we open the doors? So the first question I'll have to check on, I don't know the answer to that one specifically, but I can definitely find out for you and share with the committee. On the second question, we would be transporting students um, at the regional level, be a very small number uh, relative to how many students currently ride the bus. But you're right, there would be transportation offered uh, to families who have students who fit within phase one who choose to send their students in. I'm not sure I captured the answer, answered your question clearly though, Mr. Sullivan. Is there, did I, did I get it or am I missing something? No, you got you got it. That the buses need if we open the doors, the buses need to roll. Yeah. Any other? Um, what other questions, Ms. Seeger? Uh, just a general question on page twenty-two. It shows the middle school, and I, I guess I'm not clear on whether or not Crocker Farm students will be there because I heard they would be there, and then there was. A lot of them got moved back, so I'm I'm just not clear if this is keeping open that possibility because it does show the fifth and sixth graders being in the middle school, um, and what the current thinking is on that. Yep. So I think that goes back to the, the uncertainty about whether fourth through sixth grade would use a hybrid model or not, and until we know how many students are coming back, um, I don't think we know that yet. Um, I, I think, you know, as you know, we built all the models, assuming that 100% of students would come back. I think that's, you know, unlikely to happen. Um, so I, I do think it's, I can't say definitively, you know, on that. Um, so I, I have a hard time putting odds on it because I'm, there's a lot of variables at play, but certainly that decision would need to be made well, be, well before November when that phase would start, if that makes sense. Ms. Hall. Uh, so this question might be a, a little too specific, so I don't answer it if it is. Um, but just in the, there are multiple references in different areas um, about special needs populations and then also PPE related to teachers and students in special needs populations. Um, and I just, you know, a, a pretty consistent concern that's come up is teachers and staff who work with special needs populations that that it's you know it's less about kind of like mask enforcement and more about like what the needs of those students are um so i guess is it kind of is it too early to talk about like the you know protections in place for those teachers and staff and ways to make sure that in addition to i mean there's a reference to training but maybe a little more specificity as to how, in addition to making sure the student needs are met, also making sure that those staff are protected as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I don't want to start talking about something that would be, and I'm not suggesting you ask this way, that might be part of collective bargaining, but I think what I can say really clearly, even today, there was an outdoor meeting with a, someone who's a trainer in um, de-escalation techniques, and one of the things that came up in addition to PPE is just scrubs for people to use, so that if they're wearing kind of isolation gown that they have something underneath it that's comfortable and, and that's something that you know already went to our nurse manager to Ms. Consolino who you know who's already investigating what would be the best products uh, around that. So um, 
The short answer is, I think we were learning from places, um, public school districts, unionized public school districts who are having summer programs with special needs students right now, you know, Hadley, Holyoke, you know, Northampton as being a couple examples of that. And, you know, learning from their experience about what's worked as well as from private day schools, you know, um, schools that are out of district placements. Um, and, you know, I think we're, we're able to better understand even compared to a month from now, uh, what are tools that would be helpful for, for staff members? Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Demling and then Ms. Stancer. Uh, yeah, so uh, so first I, I just wanna agree with Ms. McDonald and Mr. Harrington's um, the point about the, the bus monitors. Um, in, in fact, a, a, a member of the public had, had actually asked about uh, volunteering and volunteering bus monitors. And I understand that a volunteer workforce comes with its own challenges, but you know, times being what they are, that's certainly something that, um, that that is is worth worth looking into, um, but but I, but I would second that. And if it's a budgetary issue, let the school committee you know <laughs> fight that battle with the towns if if we, if we need to. Um, uh, but but the the question I had was about about parent choice and and, and the, the scheduling of that. So so a couple of things is so with with, with the phasing that that, that we have, um, uh, you know, pa a parent of a uh, depending on what grade you're at, your your student is is not potentially going back on site uh, until a certain date in the calendar. And so, so the first quest, part of the question is, is, is when, when are parents making the call? When, when, do they, when do they make the decision about when are they sending their kid back or not? Like when do they get that option? And the, the second part of that parent choice, parent optionality question is we had talked in general about, well, if a, if a parent does decide to go remote or, or in person, if, if that's, if their grade is in phase at that time, um, they could decide to to switch periodically. Um, that was that was a, a, a suggestion in the, the school committee framework document. So so like when when would that happen? Is is the idea that that would happen at at the, the breaks of the phases or or quarterly or or what's 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 the thinking? Is it that you you commit at a certain point and then you can you can go back to remote whenever you want? What's 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 the current um, status of that? So I think, you know, I don't think like many districts, there would be any precursor to students going from in-person to virtual. Um, but the other way around would be at the logical breakpoints. Exactly. Are you all just surprised at what you think? <laughs> Unless, Mr. Demling, you had a follow-on to that for your original question. If it's a different question, let's go to Ms. Stancer. Yeah, I can, I can do that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Ms. Stancer. Um, so I've had someone, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had someone ask me where the BRIGHT program fits. Is that part of the special needs group? Uh, it's not right now. And the BRIGHT program is, so when we thought of the special needs group, it would be students who, um, the Bright program doesn't require special needs to be a part of it. Okay. Um, and so that's my cleanest answer for that. Okay. Anyone who has needs that are emerging in that way can be part of the Bright program. It's not like a specialized program that makes a placement decision for students with special needs. So they would follow the phases rather than being part of that first group. Okay, thank you. Ms. Kenny. So I saw in there at one point it said something about, um, you know, making sure the kids eat a hearty breakfast. So they're not inclined to want a snack and take off their mask when they're not supposed to. Um, but will the school still be doing, and then shortly thereafter it said something about the school serving breakfast. Is that still something that is going to be happening? Um, because I think there are lots of families that count on school breakfast. So uh, that's another one that we're still working out details on, especially because a later school day, there are some limits in terms of how late breakfast can be served and still qualify as breakfast under the federal requirements. So um, that is something that um, does need to be resolved and I'll, I'll get back to the committee, but I, um, it, it's, we're trying to see if how late we can push the envelope with, um, 
getting reimbursed for breakfast, you know, through the, the, the federal program, because um, there are some time constraints to that, um, I believe. So that's something that we are working on. I think the hearty breakfast was also just if students are coming in at 945 and, and we understand students may not have eaten because, you know, th there may not be food available to them. But for students who are, um, that used to be a long time to not eat. Um, so that, that was a lot of the concern was more about nutrition and health. Ms. Dancer. Um, that made me think of another question. Um, will we be providing lunch for students who are remote? The students who qualify for school lunch? So uh, that's a great question. I signed yesterday or today. There's some advocacy going on because the federal government has indicated that they're not extending the waiver um, that we had this spring that allowed us to provide meals in the way we both have been this summer, but also did this spring. Um, and so um, there's some advocacy going on, maybe something the committee wants to jump in on. Um, but it's um, the plan would be to do so, but hopefully the advocacy and common sense and decency, sorry, that's a little editorial, but it's 950, uh, went out and that we wouldn't position not just our district, but other districts um, in, in a pretty awful place that way. Mr. Demling? Can, can you briefly describe or send us information on that tomorrow morning about what you're talking about with advocacy? Because we definitely have some members of the committee that are into advocacy and this, this is, sounds like exactly something everyone here would support. Yes. Happy to do so. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, there's a section on, so it's on page 16, uh, responses to non-compliance with health and safety requirements. So I, I, I'd see that uh, it says that, you know, we will re let me get back to it. We will follow our philosophy of restorative justice and supporting positive behavior. I, I was just wondering, and I know it's probably semi-redundant, if, if there could be something added into that section that says that, that there won't be, it won't be punitive measures that are taken that, you know, a, a kid not wearing his mask today isn't going to have that follow him on his record or her record you know, throughout their education as being a non-compliant being or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. not that, that exact weird Yeah, no, it's done by omission, not by saying it clearly. So I like that yeah. um, um, clear language that you offered. Thank you. And I appreciate the, the part about the commitment to restorative justice. I like that we're reinforcing that in, in documents like this. Ms. Spitzer. Sorry, um, just trying to bring up the document. Um, so my question has to do on page seven, when we're talking about um, like the second to last paragraph where it says, as such to meet the requirements of time on learning set by the state, a range of activities will be available in the morning block at the elementary level for students attending in-person school, such as instrumental music, intervention, independent reading, and others. So I'm just trying to understand, because the day's starting so late, are students who are at home going to be expected to be doing remote like music instruction in the mornings? Or what do you, because when I look at the block schedule further on, it it shows like the morning meeting and then it shows you know some other stuff so i i just wanted to make sure i understood what was meant there sure so that uh, elementary students in massachusetts are required next year to have 850 hours of time on learning uh we're not going to meet that because of the shorter school day for in-person learning so it's trying to fill that <clears throat> excuse me morning block time with some activities that we couldn't do. And the reason instrumental music is there and we still have to work out details is that's unlikely to happen in person next year for all sorts of health and safety reasons. Um, and so we do need to assign some learning activities during that block. Obviously that's not gonna apply to all students every day, um, but to get eight, to 850 hours, um, we need to build in some virtual experience for students. Um, so that we meet those requirements. So, you know, we are working out those details. I think a lot of them will be, uh, can be couched as, you know, work that's ongoing work from school, you know, quote unquote homework uh, that could be done uh, during that time period. We're not trying to stress out families or students early in the morning, uh, but we do have to have on the schedule um, some pretty deliberate things. I think instrumental music is actually an interesting one because it is something that 
again, is going to be really hard to pull off in school. It's incredibly valuable to our students. They love it. We believe in it. We wouldn't invest as much um, energy and, and support for the program and our wonderful instrumental music teachers. Um, so that one is actually a really nice idea of how that could uh, support the time on learning as well. But it, it really is. We do need to eventually have that on our schedule so that we do meet the requisite um, time on learning minutes. Go ahead. I just, I guess, I just wanted to follow up on that because I just feel like that's going to be a huge burden for any family that's trying to get multiple kids out the door or working parents. And it may, if we can find a, way, if it's synchronous. I mean, if it's asynchronous and it's something you can kind of do when you oh, have. Yeah. Children, but like music instruction seems to me to be a fairly synchronous activity potentially if you're learning a new instrument. So I, I guess it just seems like I'm just thinking about my mornings. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that I'd also be doing a music lesson while trying to get my kids to school seems impossible. Yeah, we were thinking of mostly this being asynchronous and even with instrumental music or music in general, um, when you're doing things virtually, like if you've ever been to try to on a group that's trying to sing, just the, the, the slight differences in delay in electronic setting means it's next to impossible for groups of students. Like you see those beautiful videos like our high school students did last year. That was digitally Todd Fruth, our awesome high school um, and summit teacher, collected those and mixed them together. That didn't happen live, and none of those other ones happen live either, because it's it's quite literally impossible to do. Um, so I think there are places, even for instrumental music, where there can be some asynchronous work um, or one-on-one -on -one work, but the primary focus is that it's asynchronous. Yeah, I'm sorry, I should have been more clear about that in the document, and I'll I will. These are all great suggestions. Any other questions or comments from folks? Anybody who hasn't spoken that would like to speak? Seeing then, oh, Mr. Demling. What was the name of the section that Ms. Spitzer was just talking about? I'm, I'm constructing a motion, so I just, I just want to be specific. Um, it's on page seven. It's the executive summary. And so it's probably referenced later on as well. But. Mr. Demling? Um, I'm happy to make a motion, but I don't want to, I don't want to cut off questions or discussion. I'm just looking at the time. Um, um, is, is it okay to go ahead? Yeah. All right. uh, sorry. Um, uh, I move to adopt adopt the district reopening plan for fall 2020 for the Amherst Pelham Regional School District with the changes to the bus monitor and non-compliance mask wearing and executive summary sections as suggested. Second. Moved by Demling, seconded by Spitzer. Any further discussion from the region? Ms. Seeger. Uh, just a question. I'm noticing that the next thing we're going to talk about is a school calendar review, but the school calendar's in this. So is that, how does that work? Mr. Demling? I mean, <laughs> Dr. Morris, sorry. Um, uh, so it needs to be, the state requirement is it needs to be, um, one committee member got in touch with me, a suggestion for the calendar. I, if that doesn't need to be voted tonight, I think the big thing is generally a commitment that you would support the beginning of the year in terms of having the 10 days plus convocation day for staff as PD. Uh, it keeps the staff return date the same, which actually I think is really important because I think staff are planning that. And so... Um, I think if there are other changes in the calendar that people want to talk about, you know, and, and it may not happen tonight given the time, uh, that's okay. I think the state just needs to know that we we have a draft calendar that in, is inclusive of 10 PD days at the beginning of the school year, even if it's not voted tonight or before I submit it. Um, okay. Um, so we'll move to a roll call vote with the region. Mr. Demling. Mr. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. 
Lord, I. Mr. Menino. Menino, I. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, I. Ms. Dancer. Dancer, I. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, I. And McDonald, I. The motion passes nine to zero. Thank you, Ms. <laughs> Uh, so I'll make a motion for the Amherst School Committee. Um, I move that we adopt the fall 2020 reopening plan as presented by the superintendent with the changes to the bus monitor, non-compliance mask wearing, and executive summary sections as suggested tonight. Second. Moved by McDonald, second by Harrington. We'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, I. Ms. Lord? Lord, I. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, I. And McDonald, I. Motion passes Amherst School Committee 5 to 0. Ms. Hall? All right, thank you. Is there a motion from the Pelham School Committee? I'll make a motion for the Pelham School Committee. I move to adopt the district, district reopening plan as presented with um, the suggested changes to the bus monitoring, mask non-compliance, and executive summary as suggested tonight. Is there a second? Second. Seconded second. by Kenny. Um, all right, roll call vote. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Barlow. Barlow, aye. aye. Ms. Stancer. Try again, Margaret. You were on mute. You're on mute. Can we count that as an I? Okay. That's <laughs> an I. And Mr. Menino. Menino I. And Hall I. Motion passes Pelham five to zero. Thank you. Okay. We are now, um, we've now extended our 30 minutes already. So um, if we would like to continue, we would need to take another motion to continue. Um, I might also look to the committee for suggestions on, um, are there pieces of this that we would like to table for another meeting, assuming that that's allowed by um, public by uh, open meeting law, um, given that we've been at this till 10 o'clock. So um, I think first we should extend for 30 minutes. So is there? A... I move to extend the meeting by 30 minutes. Second. Moved by Spitzer, seconded by Demling. Um, I'm gonna take that as a region vote, as a region motion. Um, Mr. Demling? Yeah, Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, I. Ms. Lord? Lord, I. Mr. Menino? Mr. Menino? Sorry, muted. Uh, Menino, I. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, I. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, I. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, I. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, I. And McDonald, I. Um, for each one. I can make a motion for Amherst. I move to extend the meeting by 30 minutes. Second. Moved by Spitzer, second by Harrington. Roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Does Pelham have the same policy? No. Nope. Chair says it's okay. Let's yep. go. <laughs> okay. Um, we, we do have, um, of the next agenda items, we have the calendar review, um, discussion about outreach with the community, which we talked about too already. Um, 
appointing uh, school committee members to the bargaining teams and future agenda planning, warrant report get, and gifts. Um, I might, um, I'm, I'm just gonna look for some nods from my public meeting experts, Dr. Morris and Mr. Demling, um, about whether we can move to table some of these agenda items and, uh, and tackle only the appointing of um, committee members to the bargaining team and the future agenda planning. Mr. Demling? As far as I understand it, there's no legal requirement and it's, it's your it's chair's discretion and committee's will. How does the committee feel? Like that plan? Okay. Um, so in our, when we get to future agenda planning, we'll talk about when we'll address these other agenda items. But um, so we'll move on to um, item E, which is appointing our school committee members to the bargaining team. Um, I, in, in looking at a, um, a bunch of policy, um, policy that we need to look at in light of uh, um, the um, operating schools in, the, in a pandemic, we, we have several policies that um, the policy subcommittee has been um, drafting, um, that, but, and as we were doing that, discovered there is a policy about appointing members that I've also since learned is, is um, actually um, needs updating. Um, so it's in the packet, but um, there's uh, pieces of it that um, we know are not, um, are void. Um, namely the negotiating agent is, is the piece of that. So um, just to be clear that that was, I think we just take that as a reference point um, as opposed to um, our guidance right now. So the policy team has a lot to work on. Um, so we have, um, I, I believe Mr. Harrington that you had been appointed as a, as a member for the UFCW. Um, so are you willing to continue in that appointment? Yes, I am. Are there others that are interested in serving with Mr. Harrington? Um, it's not a requirement. Is it better to have more than one? Dr. Morris? Uh, so yes, and, uh, you know, I think, um, there's other bargaining groups that might need members. So I wonder uh, respectfully if Ms. McDonald might wanna see if there's a full group who want, might wanna be involved in some of the other bargaining groups and then come back to Mr. Harrington and his need for partners <laughs> or desire for partners after um, we can maybe look at some of the other groups because there are, there are three bargaining groups I, I shared with Ms. McDonald earlier, I think, um, uh, particularly for um, the APEA, um, you know, that's three bargaining groups within one. So that is a more complex um, set of bargaining groups um, just because of the nature of, you know, it's, it's three distinct uh, units within one. Um, so um, I don't know, just my suggestion is um, see who can participate in, uh, in that one and see if there are extra members who are willing to join Mr. Harrington. Uh, and some people may have an interest more in, in working on USCW, so I don't want to be dismissive of that. That may be more of someone's interest too. But. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. So um, why don't we then jump to that one, the APEA um, uh, bargaining team. And I know that um, folks have asked um, sort of what does that time commitment look like and sort of giving, maybe it would be helpful, Dr. Morris, if you could give us an idea, since I think we have a lot of, um, or multiple new members, that it might be helpful to understand sort of what that commitment could look like. Sure, so uh, we've been, um, already been in contact looking to start that process next week. Uh, they've shared with us that they, you know, would like they being the uh, APEA, they'd like to have uh, which is pretty typical session on ground rules, um, and they they would look forward to having um, sort of two hour time frames for negotiating. Again, very typical and makes total sense to me and and to Miss Cunningham as well. Um, so they'd like to start next week, um, and um, they'd be during daytime with the times that were um, suggested to us. Um, 
So I think the first session perhaps would be an hour and a half. And after that, trying to block out two hour sessions. Um, and, um, you know, it's a little hard to predict how long these things go, but um, we try to maintain really good working relationships with our associations. And, and part of that is, is um, bargaining in good faith. And it's a really important thing that school committee members can be a part of. Uh, and so, you know, I would think probably given the time frame that it's, it's August 6th, um, that probably I would imagine two times per week would be, you know, a reasonable expectation for the next few weeks. Okay. And primarily um, daytime. That was, yeah, that was what worked best for um, for the members and, and we try to work around their schedule as best we can. Mm -hmm. Any volunteers? So um, uh, just, uh, this is a region um, commitment, correct? So typically, according to policy, and I think it's in the packet that the region does um, assign negotiate. I'm gonna double check that, because I'm sorry. Um, I, oh, I have that up. Um, oh, great. Um, it's... Yeah, so the regional school committee will appoint, you know, everything's framed as in Oh, the first sentence, Amherst Palm Regional School Committee is responsible for negotiations with employee bargaining groups. So just that first sentence of that policy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, it took me a second. Yeah. No. Any volunteers? Ms. Lord? Oh, you're volunteering? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Anybody else? Given the complexity of this one and the three units, I, I do think if we if there's another person, it would be helpful to have two. Um, and particularly if we can have two people from different towns, um, sort of in the spirit of the policy that is old. No other volunteers. Is there um, I'm just trying to think. I think probably people are, are nervous about the, the time commitment and particularly daytime because I think almost all of us have have daytime uh, work commitments, jobs that um, that pay us so that we can do this volunteer work. <laughs> um, so I is there flexibility in terms of being on the negotiating team maybe um I'm, d I'm just thinking out loud if there's any ways that we can think about this that might make it easier for somebody to see themselves um participating in the negotiating team oh sorry miss spitzer i can yeah, i i can't i i have no starting my daughter's childcare has closed for the rest of the summer and I have a job that I'm already reducing my hours on significantly. So I, there's an, absolutely no way I could participate during daytime meetings. Um, I potential, I, I'd be happy to consult or think through like I, I but I, I'd, I'd be jeopardizing my employment if I were to volunteer. I not putting out so if there's a way we can do some sort of evening consulting, I, I'd be happy to work with um, Ms. Lord or Mr. Harrington. Um, I think this is really important and I don't want people to think I'm shirking my duties, but the, the pandemic's affected all of us and our ability to, with childcare and, and work requirements, so. Totally understand, yep. I don't, you don't have to apologize for that. Um, Mr. Demling? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, I think any any addition, um, any, any any ability that we have to to contribute is is appreciated, and 
you know, I mean, you know, to, 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 to the degree we can, I think is beneficial. So I don't think if that's five minutes, you know, over the course of the entire negotiation, that's five minutes that we didn't have. That's a point of view that we didn't have. And I think that would be beneficial. So obviously, you know, we don't have a massive stable of people that are running to and able to volunteer. And that's no criticism. I'm not raising my hand either, you know, so, um, uh, you know, it's a tough situation all around. So I, I, I don't think you should feel guilty if you can only volunteer a little bit. And, and if you can't make a, a lot of or most of most of the meeting, um, I think anything you can contribute would be, would be awesome. Um, and I would totally support any kind of a flexible arrangement like that. I'm seeing, I'm not seeing anybody objecting to that, um, to that suggestion. So I think we'll, um, we'll appoint um, Ms. Lord as our, on um, our negotiating team and Ms. Spitzer, um, where, 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 where feasible. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, and now we have AFSCME. Dr. Morris. So that's AFSCME. Um, you know, I talked to Ms. Cunningham before the meeting. Um, we were successful in not having a school committee representative uh, this spring to develop a MOA with AFSCME. Uh, I think we're optimistic that a similar um, thing could happen. So if there's a volunteer that wants to join, that's great. But I think, um, you know, uh, from Ms. Cunningham's point of view, and I trust her uh, very much, um, it'll be... Um, if there's not another person who can who can dedicate the time, we can just report back to the committee in executive session how it's going. Uh, we could always amend that, but I think um, given that you know all the the things that people shared about joining the other negotiating teams, um, Ms. Cunningham feels confident and um, that we can we can work that out. Um, and if you know something changes, we'll let you know. But um, and if someone wants to join it, that's fantastic. But uh, people shouldn't feel to, like they need to push themselves on that one. If the um, if the rest of the committee is comfortable with that, um, I would say let's let's proceed as Dr. Morris has suggested. I'm seeing nodding heads. So okay, great. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Harrington, Ms. Lord, and Ms. Spitzer for stepping up. Um, truly appreciate it. So. Um, okay. So future uh, meeting planning, uh, Mr. Menino. A suggestion for a future item. Mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate Dr. Morris's clarification on distance learning, how it would be taught. I think elaboration would be welcome. Uh, I fear this won't happen, but the Boston guidance is that teachers will simultaneously teach in class and online. I don't know how they're going to do that. I don't think we plan on that, but I would like uh, distance learning discussed in greater detail. So we also have, we um, have the 2020-2021 calendar review. Um, outreach. Um, at some point, we need to do the evaluation as well. I, I'd really like to make sure that it gets done, even if it means lowering the bar a bit on um, the amount of effort we put into it this year. But I want to make sure it gets done. Okay. Um, do we have policies that have been on previous agendas? Yeah, yeah. we get the policies off. I don't know the status of the the letter um, that uh, we were going to that we also had had on the agenda for tonight. We may want to rethink or relook. At, no, actually, that still still pertains. I would say. I'm looking at Mr. Demling because you were spearheading that letter writing. Uh, which which policy are you talking about? It's not the policy. It was the letter um, for rapid testing site. Oh yeah, yeah. We'll have to think about that. Um, yeah, we'll we'll have to think about that. I, 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 it's it's too late for my brain to digest okay. the implications of the recent news. 
Um, but while, while, while we're talking about agenda planning, um, I was thinking um, our minutes are getting kind of backed up and all over the place, which is totally understandable given the flurry of meetings. Um, but since these are important meetings and I don't want to get us into an awkward position where we're just saying, yeah, 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 about things that maybe we say things and we, and we don't. Anyway, I, I think maybe it might be good to maybe batch these things up where maybe um, maybe we get uh, like a whole bunch of them together uh, mailed out to us where we can have the time to like go through them all and take a bunch of notes. And then we have an agenda item that has like, you know, a half a dozen meeting approvals. Yeah. Uh, or minute approvals and we and we're able to go through them you know conscientiously as opposed to just um uh realizing they're there at the beginning of the meeting yep I don't know how the, other people feel about that i i do agree because at some point we're gonna have to approve them and the longer we wait the longer um so do we want to look at tuesday um or uh, dr morris so just, uh, it depends whether the group wants to continue having joint meetings or not to a certain extent. Um, so Pelham, the next meeting Pelham could have would be on Thursday uh, because of OML and posting. Uh, I'm just looking at the items you mentioned. Calendar review technically is a regional decision. Uh, again, I'm not suggesting that our Pelham friends wouldn't have thoughts, but um, it, it is a regional item that, um, and it always has been to my knowledge. Um, the outreach, distance learning planning, those seem like joint items. Uh, policies, that's up to the chairs about how they view that. Typically, they go through region first. Um, you know, I have ad advocacy for food service in addition to an email that may be something that the committee actually wants to take up. Um, so it may be the case that we want to um, think about what needs to be joint meetings and then perhaps what needs to be a, particularly a region meeting um, as, as compared to a joint meeting because some of the items, I mean, region, we could frankly post tomorrow and meet on Tuesday on some of these things uh, and a joint meeting either could be Thursday or waiting till the next week. Um, you know, the one that seems pressing to me that that's a joint uh, is kind of the outreach piece. Um, so that's the only one that's sort of a bummer that if we met Tuesday um, I don't know if we'd have the goodwill of the, our Pelham colleagues to um, roll with what the region came up with in terms of outreach, but that one seems like really timely and perhaps not worth waiting. Um, sorry, I'm trying to solve issues five hours in. I may not be doing a very coherent job, but. Understood. Ms. Hall? Um, yeah, so I mean, I have been in communication with the town clerk and it's possible that we could get an agenda to her and post tomorrow. So could we maybe have like an aspirational approach for a joint meeting on Tuesday? And then the chairs, sorry, Ms. McDonald could scramble a bit tomorrow and try to figure this out as early as possible and then communicate to the rest of the group. Yep, and I think we'd also wanna have the executive session given that negotiations are starting soon uh, with, um, about negotiations with the full committee so that the people who are involved in negotiations get to hear from the full committee about um, the charge and, and some thoughts so that that process can start with the full committee's input. Okay. That sounds good. So I guess tomorrow morning, we'll try to, Chairs and I will try to wrap our heads around this and see what we can do. Sounds yeah. good. Okay. Okay. Ms. Seeger. I, I just want to ask a basic question of, um, I know we're talking about Tuesday. Um, are there any sort of on the calendar meetings or I, I, <laughs> words are not flowing right now? Um, I, I've, I haven't been able to keep a firm track of when meetings are going to happen. Are there any um, just sort of standing times that the regional committee meets that I should have on the calendar of like, every second Tuesday, or is it really ad hoc at this point? Um, I just want to con, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Our, our, we, we, we determine our schedule at the beginning of every um, calendar year. So uh, probably in the next couple of weeks, we'll be doing that for the, for the, you know, through June of okay. 2021. Um, but yeah, we ran out of pre, pre 
scheduled meetings um, back in June. <laughs> okay, this is a pandemic sort of thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, anybody uh, uh, from Amherst, would you like to make a motion? Move to adjourn. Moved by Spitzer. Second. Second by Harrington. No discussion. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Amherst is adjourned. Ms. Hall. All right, Pelham, make me proud. I move we adjourn. Second. Moved, moved by Kenny, seconded by Stancer. All right, roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Stancer. Sir, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Barlow. Barlow, aye. And Hall, aye. Pelham is adjourned. I move to adjourn the region. Is there a second? Second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm moved by McDonald, second by Spencer. We'll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Uh, the region is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Good night.